Monaco Pizza presents SCP. The Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts, Steve Dangle and Jesse Blake. So, so many things just happened. Yeah, we have I to stop talking like, about hockey. <laughs> I feel like this podcast, I'm going to ask one question, and two hours later, the show's going to be done. Wow. That that cut your question asking in half right? from what it usually is. <laughs> usually it's like two questions, and then we do the crowd, and then the show's over. Now we have four crowns. And now we have four crowns today. The difference three. is it's divided among four people, right. rather than just me give out three and you give out one. So one thing that happened before the show was that Ian and Rachel, who are sitting in the room, Ian Tulloch and Rachel Dory. Ian Graff. Ian Graff, <laughs> sorry. Ian Graff. They realized this is the first time you guys will be doing a podcast in person, even though you have your own podcast. How many episodes have we done? 11? <laughs> I think 11 or 12, yeah. Yeah, something like that. And yeah. you doesn't... do them over a time? Uh, yeah, we do it remotely. I do mine in Mississauga, and you do yours in... Newmarket. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so... Over Skype. Yeah. How does it feel? It's In we person? Are... It's weird. We're I don't like it. We're two minutes in. <laughs> I know, because now both of us can be like, give each other the, what are you talking about, stares. But like, I can mm. tell when she's being sarcastic as she's saying something, so it's it's not the same. I don't it's like it. It's not the same? No. no. I much prefer it remotely. I like the comfort of my bedroom. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to read this show. I'm such a blogger. What do you mean? <laughs> I don't know. Well, because you have, you have Rachel, who we've already had on, and was mm-hmm. a fantastic, well-informed guest. Rachel Dory, by the way, on Twitter, D-O-E-R-R-I-E. We have Ian who's already been on the podcast. Ian Graff on Twitter. Well-informed, fantastic guest. Yes. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get a word in. Nope. But also, what I remember about Ian is he came armed with a computer. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't bring it this time. Uh, no. It, but Which it was, was shocking. The question <laughs> yeah. was half out of my mouth, and you're like, glad you asked. Like, <laughs> you go right into it, and you're like, I have every stat ever. I had a Cody Franson a- spreadsheet ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was crazy how you had the exact right information. I knew it was going to come up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just pulls up this PowerPoint. has got his clicker ready. Got a like, couple graphs mm-hmm. to show him. Like, oh, it's a podcast. This doesn't work. So. <laughs> Ian Graff. We haven't seen you since Ian Graff. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah, telling yeah. Adam, like, I'm down to come on again. Like, the new oh, studio. Sure. But, uh, yeah, didn't get any invites. So. Wow. Oops. You're wow. sitting here now. How can you still <laughs> criticize us? Because Adam's not here and it's funny. Well, there you go. Congratulations again to Adam. That's super cool. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Dad, 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 Dad Wild. Mm. That yeah, is very yeah. cool. So where can people hear your podcast? Let's get that in first. Wherever you're listening to this, probably so like um, Spotify, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, I don't know, Stitcher, Google, Google Play. Like I look at our stats and it's like 38 percent of our listeners are from the other category. So it's it's Everywhere. Those random third yeah. party apps that people use. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. Hey, are you are you on Pod Catch Bean? And I'm like, I have no <laughs> idea what <laughs> that is. But maybe. <laughs> right, yeah, you right. can it's on all the big ones. So the other thing that happened before the podcast was that everybody in this room realized they've watched a total of one game in the Stanley Cup finals from start to finish? From yes, start to 60 finish. minutes worth of hockey. I haven't watched a full game yet. We have four hardcore hockey fans that is that fair to say? Yeah. In a room. And like, yeah. I was fully invested in Washington, Vegas. That was an exciting cup final. Yeah. You're guaranteed to have a team win the cup for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, I literally bailed on a date to watch one of the games last year. Yeah. Wow. Like, that's how inv- I was like, sorry, like, this is important. And this year. And what so is why it? is that? It's, it's not as simple as, oh, it's the Bruins and I'm still salty. There's another team. Mm-hmm. If I don't know why I don't really care. If it would have been the Sharks, I feel like we would have been more invested just because you have, like, the whole Thornton story, but also it would be Thornton versus the Bruins. Like, it would just be more interesting. Eric Carlson, Carlson playing on one leg Eric, and still yeah. dominating. Yeah, Blues fans were getting annoyed at us because whenever we talked about the Blues Shark series, it was always from the Sharks' perspective. Yeah. And it is nothing against the Blues. It's just the Sharks are far and away the more fascinating team. I love Colton Pareko for what it's worth. I mean, he's yeah. like six foot six, can skate like the wind. He's an animal. Ryan O'Reilly's like a great defensive player, which is like what a player you want on your team. Patrice Bergeron, great defensive player. You want that player in your team. But I'd much rather watch Connor McDavid. I'd much rather watch, I don't know, some electrifying high octane offensive player. So it's nothing Tampa. against those players. Yeah, Tampa <laughs> yeah. Bay. Would have been nice if they Oops. won a game in the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> but it's not even, it's not enough that, like, of course they have good players. They're in the Stanley Cup mm-hmm. final. 
I just don't care. <laughs> is the hockey just not interesting to you? Like the style that they're playing? I tell you what, as as a neutral party, um, the jobbing from the refs last night was the best thing that could have happened in that series. Because yeah. I'm locked in now. I feel like that's I don't been think the I'll miss the playoffs. Really, is that the officiating? Has there been a worse officiated playoffs no. in the NHL like over the last decade? Never. I'm trying Ever? to think. It's it's been really had bad. A poll up today. Which is the worst bad call? Eakin in the first round. Oh. Timo Meyer hand pass. One other one, and then the one last night. And I'm like, the fact that there's enough for a poll is not okay. a good sign. Yeah, there was the game two of the Leafs sharks. Bruins, which got a few officials like oh. suspended, basically. Weren't yep. able to do the rest of the playoffs. There's been a lot of just terrible officiating on both sides. It's it's not like one team's getting a ton of calls, because yeah. now even Boston, the team that what many would argue was the recipient of a lot of good calls, they just got jobbed <laughs> in a couple calls, so it's... Kind of okay, ridiculous. before before we dive into the whole call, we'll do that after. <laughs> sure, we do sure, the most sure. important part of the show. Mm-hmm. So the Steve Dangle podcast teamed up with Crown Royal, and every episode we crown a new king in sports. So we got four crowns. We'll let the new guests go first. Who is your crown for today? All right, uh, la- ladies to? first is is definitely the gentlemanly I'm, way to Rachel? do this. <laughs> Are you doing a basketball one, or am I doing a basketball one? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, I will give my crown to Kyle Lowry. Okay. Uh, I thought he was terrific in Game Three, given the uh, garbage that he had to deal with. <laughs> um, he handled it well, and if you look at how he handled himself while it was going on in the scope of the game. And then afterwards, there was a lot of things that he could have said that would have really vilified him. And he chose to take the high road. And not only that, I thought he was arguably the best player on the floor for the Raptors in I've, Game 3. I've never seen a player single-handedly get an owner fired. <laughs> that was amazing. So, yeah. Was he fired technically? No, they're going to force what? him to shell, sell his shares, apparently. Wow. As fired as an owner... That's be. pretty brutal. I know right. they banned him for a year from NBA games and fined him five hundred thousand, which is not much to him. He's worth two point four billion, I think. Yeah, oh, I feel that like it? that's literally yeah. ten dollars. That. That's a yeah. Starbucks coffee yeah. for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's so Kyle Lowry's mine. I was gonna jokingly go with Tyler Bozak for the the non trip, and then <laughs> then the goal that proceeded, finding a way to beat the Bruins in the playoffs for once. That was great, but um. No, I'm going to actually go with Danny Green. If you guys have been following the Raptors, oh. I don't know if you watched the last couple series, but he couldn't hit a shot. and It was really frustrating. And I felt like I needed to write an article about it because I'm like, <laughs> no, Danny Green's really good at this. If you look historically throughout his career, I think he set the record for most threes made in an NBA Finals back when he was on the Spurs. You look at his open three-point percentage in the regular season. He was a top five three-point shooter in the regular season. He was in the three-point contest at the All-Star game. He's a really good shooter, and he just wasn't making any shots. And I wrote an article, I'm like, look, regression to the mean, it's going to happen. He's going to knock down some shots in the finals, and we're all going to love Danny Green again. He went, what, six for eight in his last game from downtown? It was ridiculous. Kyle Lowry also hit a bunch of big shots in that game. And, yeah, those three-point shots were the difference. So I'm a big fan of Danny Green. I love his defense. I love it when he's hitting his shots. When he's missing his shots, he's still... Still like him because he's a podcast host, much like ourselves, yes. and uh, <laughs> yes. you got you got to respect the man. And yeah, I've always been a big fan of his game. Uh, Crown Royale, the the king, the crown goes to uh, Crown Danny Royale. Green. A fun yeah. fact about Danny Green: uh, there are thirty five players in the NBA Finals history to attempt fifty threes. Thirty four of them are under fifty percent. The one above fifty percent shooting in NBA Finals history is Danny Green. There you wow. go, best, best, shoot, best three point shooter in, in NBA, NBA Finals, Finals but history. But they should bench yeah. him, according to <laughs> Raptors Twitter. Well, do you remember Fred Van Vliet? I mean, honestly, as a fan, early in any series, whether it was the Seventy Sixers series or the Bucks series, Fred Van Vliet was missing every open three, and it was driving you nuts. Then I want to say he went nine for eleven in his last two games against the Bucks <laughs> yeah. in Games Five and Game Six. It and was, um, the Raptors won those games, and it was great. <laughs> turning point, I want to say, was the back half of Game 2 against Milwaukee. Was that the but, overtime game? or was, No, that was the game they got crushed. No, that, game 2, they got destroyed. Yeah, they got decked. They yeah. went to the bench early, and even though they got like destroyed, the bench actually did pretty good. I was like, okay, that's encouraging. And then it, it continued in Game 3, and the starters joined them. And uh, they actually didn't lose a game after that. <laughs> Against Milwaukee. See, I know basketball. I'm, I'm going to need to stop myself from talking so much about basketball because I'm so into it right now. For those who aren't watching, I'm wearing a Kawhi Leonard jersey right now. <laughs> Tonight is game four. I'm not sure when you're listening to this, but yeah, Maybe. Raptors mania is real right now. I've been a huge basketball fan all my life. I tend to focus my analysis on hockey, but 
I feel like so many people from the Toronto area and who listen to Leafs podcasts are hardcore into the Raptors right now, so I feel like I have to talk about it. I mean, we have not stopped ourselves from talking <laughs> Raptors, so we've given like several crowns to Raptors, so I mean, fill your boots, Steve man. Dangle talking about the pick and roll defense. And totally. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Man, they talked about the restricted area beneath the net. I learned that this playoff run. I did not know that oh, was well. a th- I did not know. I know. I knew three in the key. I thought it was really smart. And when it, uh, Golden State had the ball, and then they went uh, beyond, they, they went across the center court line and went, ah, that's against rules. I know that from Magic Johnson's fast break. Oh, baby. That I <laughs> NBA courtside 2002. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, it's, you're not allowed to do fun, that. It's fun seeing people become basketball fans through this run. Like, the Raptors mm. are really doing something special. And I hate the mentality of, like, bandwagon fans. Because yeah. bandwagon fans become regular fans and then become hardcore fans. So eventually everyone was a bandwagon. I was a bandwagon <laughs> fan when I was five. Yeah. Because I was like, those, those are the you know, Raptors. Lecture, that kindergartners, hey! Right? At the beginning of this playoff run, my girlfriend didn't know who many Raptors were. She knew who Kawhi was, and she knew who Kyle Lowry was. Now she's literally yelling at the TV, don't take that shot, Gasol, take it inside. Yeah, yeah, and she's yeah, yeah, like, yeah. no, don't switch that. You need Lowry on him. And it's like, wow, she's really into the basketball now. She's with me, who's a big-time nerd, isn't explaining all these stupid concepts to her that most people probably don't care about, but... Now she's a hardcore fan and she watches every minute of every game. Pass it to him. Regression to the mean. Regression to the mean. (laughs) I agree with Jesse, though. Like, everyone starts out as a bandwagoner. You don't. The Raptors this run have got my 81 year old grandmother involved. That woman has watched the sport in I don't even know how long. (laughs) All of a sudden, she's yelling at me that I'm interfering with her watching the basketball game because I've decided to be a great grandchild and call her. Nope, I'm interfering with her watching the Raptors. So I'm like, okay. Why would you call her during a Raptors playoff game? It was commercial. Ridiculous. And then she yelled at me if I don't call her once a week, so now I gotta call her. But if it's during the Raptors game, which apparently she's a fan of now. Mm-hmm. I'm with her. I wouldn't have even picked up the phone. <laughs> well, she did hang up on me, so. <laughs> Steph Curry sank 1 3 as soon as you called, and she was like, nope, never again. Not speaking. Yeah. So it's, it's great to see all these people become basketball fans. Steve, totally. who's your uh, Crown Royal, Crown of the Week going to? Crown of the oh. Day. You blew my cover a little bit there, Ian. I am giving mine to the always clean Tyler Bozak hey, oh, for sorry. playing a, <laughs> an infraction-free game <laughs> and assisting on the game winner in Game 5. He's just finishing his check. He was just, just like... Finishing his check <laughs> and crossing the T and dotting the I as well and taking out a leg with his stick and his own leg. The guy was already going down. Guy was oh, yeah, <laughs> was on sure. his way down. <laughs> for sure. He dove, didn't you know? Oh, God. He could have gone two and two, you know, a trip and a dive. So they just offset it. it for right? sure. No, maybe just the dive, which never gets called. Just all, right, dive. all right, all right. We'll, we'll do that. It was really I know, bad. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> So when you're enjoying the games, why not consider a crown royal at Puck Drop? Why not? And don't drop anyone with your stick or your leg when you're dropping your puck into your crown I wonder how many Bruins fans, based on some of the uh, videos I was seeing on Twitter last night of Mm -hmm. the stands, had had a few too many crown royals. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, the the fighting in the the stands was crazy. Two fights. Yeah, the 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 fighting. I'm sure there were more than two. Those are just the two that were on Twitter. I was too busy watching fight videos. I was too busy watching replays of Dave Portnoy get hit with a towel over and over again. Yes. The the guy from Barstool Sports. I I saw that. uh, What a... I never condone violence, but it was a towel, so uh, I don't... I think, I? It, I think it was a work. <laughs> For any wrestling fans, I think that was a work. Yeah. I also don't have a whole lot of sympathy. Yeah, that's that's more what it comes down to. Oh, cool. The comment section's going to be right. awesome. So, oh, sorry, your Barstool yeah. fans here. I'm sorry. sorry. No, no, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that, man. I didn't, no, they wrote a whole article about me after uh, my uh, Bruins little pant-shitting episode. <laughs> that doesn't shock ago. me in the slightest. Barstool did? Yeah, it was like, oh, this Leaf fan said... Because someone cut a clip yeah, from, from the that show yeah. and, like, edited it. And yeah. it, 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 it... I don't know. I As soon as I saw the link, I'm like, I'm about to have a very bad Twitter day. And I got, like, five tweets. Oh. Yeah, it was... Lovely. Yeah, it was very odd. Okay. Can I just so, say that the best okay. thing about Twitter when you have, like, enough followers is you can... The quality filter, like, you can just... I'm not going to look at my mentions today kind of thing. That's what I do. I'm like, well, I'm not going to look at anything. My quality filter was I was at a wedding that day. <laughs> I was on one. Felt really good. And left it alone. Well, you're at like over 100,000, right? Or what are you at? Followers? On Twitter? Yeah. You had something. 
crazy. I just hit 10,000 this week, and I'm like, oh, crap. Now I'm going to have to start dealing with a lot more, like... Garbage. Yep. Tell you. The fun replies. Tell you take it. Tell you interpret. It's... We were talking about this uh, just at Starbucks. If, If someone says something to you that's just not true, it's like, you ever seen Goodwill Hunting? Yep. That that scene, you know, something occurred to me, and I fell into a deep, peaceful sleep, and I haven't thought about you since. <laughs> you know who went to Starbucks yesterday and got a free coffee? Cam Neely. Did he? Because it was his birthday yesterday. Oh. Is, that, is that the one that he threw at the wall, or is that the... <laughs> that was a Dasani water bottle. Okay, sorry. He had so... a uh, very <laughs> bad birthday. Yeah, on his birthday, he gets gifted the wonderful call of Tyler Bozak not getting called for tripping. I would... Achari. I would hate to be on the other end of that phone call to NHL head office this mm-hmm. morning because that was not a fun phone call to take. You're not having a good day. Or, or the TD Garden worker working on that room. Because, oh like, what if you're standing God. at the door? Hey, anyone want creep? <laughs> like, Farva? <laughs> Just get decked? Uh, be brutal. Bruce Cassidy called it a black eye on the NHL for officiating. Uh, the director of officiating, Stephen Walcombe, said they don't comment on uh, subjective plays on the ice. I forgot to include that in the video today. Yeah. Like, dude, what do you get paid for? Like, what a useless statement. Mm-hmm. So what do you guys make of the whole situation? The many controversial calls throughout the playoffs. Ian, do you want to start? I, the, the funny thing is, I just I don't want to talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's the frustrating thing. No one wants to talk about officiating. When you're watching hockey, you're watching your favorite team, whether it's Speak the Leafs, yourself. whether it's the Bruins, whether it's the Dallas Stars, pick your favorite team, Carolina Hurricanes. You don't want to talk about officiating because then you sound like that whiny little kid who's like, oh, my team only lost because of the refs. And no, even if you're not getting a great whistle, you should still be playing well enough that you're going to win the game anyways. We shouldn't care so much about officiating. If it's close enough to like, you know, 50-ish, 50-ish, you deal with it. The hard part is I feel like they're not even getting 50% of the calls right at this point. And it's so no. frustrating to see blown call after blown call dictate the outcome of the game. And I think another frustrating thing is the fact that if one penalty is called on one team, let's say the Blues get called for a trip, the refs feel like they need to call the Bruins on a trip. And let's say the Bruins have now taken a trip and penalty. They feel like they need to call a penalty on the Blues. And I feel like that feeling the need to even things up is funny enough. It's They're trying to do the right thing, but that's skewing their objectivity. And you're going to end up missing actual calls because you're trying so hard to even things up. In the NBA, they've tried really hard to get rid of that bias. And I know that there's going to be frustrations with officiating the NBA. I know it was it game two that didn't quite go the Raptors way. For what it's worth, game three, Kawhi Leonard traveled a couple times and it did not get called. So I'm just going to throw I that out the there. I think the star players in the NBA get so much leniency. Like, I, mm. Clay Thompson took four full steps and it wasn't called. I think it was in round three. And I'm like, um, I thought traveling was two. Like, the third step was the travel. <laughs> but here he is taking four steps. Stars do get a bit of leeway, especially guys like LeBron and whatnot. But, I mean, at the end of the day in the NBA, I feel like it's close to getting the calls right and like it doesn't really dictate the outcome of the game maybe that's just the nature of basketball there's so many possessions each team gets 100 shots per game so eventually it's going to balance things out in hockey i feel like we got reaching the point where i almost don't want to watch the product anymore because of how bad the officiating is in the playoffs i just feel like it's the refs are dictating the outcome of the game why should i watch these two extremely talented hockey players do awesome things on the on the ice together if at the end of the day it's just going to be this stupid officiating system that ends up dictating the outcome of the game. It's frustrating to me and I don't want to deal with it anymore. Dude, I, I blew my lid when the Bruins were getting away with it in round two after round one and all that fun. And I started to think, I was like, am I actually losing my mind? Like, hmm. am I letting this get to me? And nothing has made me feel better than the reaction to the rest of the playoffs from all the other fan bases. I've just been like, oh, okay, no, it's garbage wall to wall, and everyone sees it. And even last night, we finally got them. The Bruins, <laughs> they're in. The the fans get it. They're like, oh my god, it's wall to wall trash. It's it's not. I I think a, a friend of mine put it very well last night. Andrew Berkshire. It was Andrew Berkshire. I really like him. The Blues are everyone. Get ready to agree, except for Bruins fans who are going to scream. The Blues are out Bruining the Bruins. Here's how it usually works. Team takes a penalty. Team takes another penalty. Like you said, the ref goes, "Uh uh-oh, I need to even it up, and they'll at least make it 2-1. Maybe even 2-2. The Blues are going, I think Justin Bourne wrote this about Dustin Bufflin once. 
their tactic is every shift has 19 infractions and you can't possibly call them all. So you just get away with almost everything. Like you can't tell me like last night, the penalties were actually three penalties for the blues to one for the Bruins. Yeah. But that's exactly even what I'm up, talking about. Yep. The even up was the penalties that were not called. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. No, like, I oh, just... I can't possibly call a fourth on St. Mm-hmm. Louis when Bozak trips him here. So I guess I'll just let that one go. And then it leads to a goal right afterwards. And you and it was four minutes after they killed off the most recent penalty. By trying so hard to do what you think was the right thing, you ended up doing the wrong thing. I think that's the problem here is that the even up call is ruining hockey, especially in the playoffs. How much did the timing of the trip have to play with it? Because there was nine minutes left in the entire game, one goal game. Nothing. That's the referee the thing just that bothers me. Like, as someone who has watched and like been a part of the officiating in hockey like at the minor league level this whole thing of i can't call it because there's nine minutes left in the game is garbage like it's awful if it's a penalty it is a damn penalty because i guarantee you if somebody chicken winged someone in open ice and sent them flying they're gonna have to call that whether there's a minute left in the game or a minute into the game so for me like the fact, and you're totally right because it impacts it. We've all seen, like, the rule book goes out the window in the playoffs and then even further so in overtime. You would literally have to straight out murder someone to get a penalty called against you in overtime. So for me, where we are in the game should have no bearing on whether or not it's a penalty. If it is an infraction, call it. The thing that Jeff Merrick said on radio, like, call, call the book and guess what? They'll adjust because... If you apply it to real life, if I'm driving 140 on the highway and then I get a speeding ticket, guess what? Probably not going to drive 140 all that often anymore. <laughs> yep. Okay, so if you are if you start calling it by the book and you continue to be consistent, guess what? They're probably going to adjust. These are professional athletes. You mm-hmm. won't have this problem anymore. To play a bit of a devil's advocate, I think a lot of people in the playoffs don't want to see it called the exact same way that it's called in the regular season. I think they want to see a bit more leeway on some hits. They want to see a bit more physicality. They want to see a bit more rough stuff after the whistle. They want to see... But that's because you know, they're that... conditioned for that, right? Like, you've got to change that because you can't be playing a different game in the playoffs. Like, that makes... Basketball doesn't change the rules in the playoffs. Like, the one thing that the NHL doesn't do that the NBA does and the NFL did in the NFC Championship is they came out and they admitted they made a mistake on the pass interference call. And the NBA has the last two-minute report and then Stephen Walkham comes out and goes, we don't comment on judgment calls. You shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> like, what is the purpose of even opening your mouth at that point? Yeah. Like, I would like to see the NHL have some type of transparency. So if there is a controversial call like there was last night, there had better be an explanation and a damn good one for it. And as someone who has talked about how he's really frustrated with officiating, I'd like to say that at least the NHL seems to be trying to make the referees accountable for what they feel are wrong decisions. If you've made a really, really bad call in an important playoff game, those referees are no longer officiating well, late, deeper in the playoffs. So but now they're running out of officials. That's the hard so part. It's calls. like at some point you can't just keep giving detentions to people. You need to overhaul your system. And I feel like yeah. they really need to look at it in the offseason because... I mean, look at your fans. Look at the ratings. Like, people aren't liking what you're doing lately, and it's it's really, really frustrating. And it's ruining what I think is the best product when it comes to sports. I love watching hockey. We all love hockey in this yep. room. It's our favorite sport to watch. I'd much rather watch a neutral basketball game, even one that the Raptors aren't involved with. I watched way more of the Golden State-Portland NBA series than I did of the Western Conference Final or the Eastern Conference Final in the NHL because the product was more entertaining. So if the officiating is getting in the way of what's supposed to be the most entertaining product in the world, you need to do something about that. I I was just thinking, you know who probably enjoyed last night more than, or just as much as any Blues fan, is the four refs who were kicked out of the playoffs for a poor performance. (laughs) Yeah, not so easy, is it? (laughs) You know, it's just, I don't know, it couldn't possibly be that the game is, how much faster is the game this year than last you know, it's just been terrible. Yeah, is it is NHL hockey so difficult to referee? Is that is that it? <laughs> Last night, yes, they it's, had two it's, gimmies. I they, would like to see. Gimmies. I would like to see a ref in the stands because hmm. similar to what they have in soccer, which is where they have an unofficial off the field that watches and can radio because they're all hooked up by a mic, can radio into the guy's earpiece and say like, "Hey, like this happened or whatever." 
give the off-ice official the ability to call because there's stuff that happens away from the play. There's only two officials, and there's 10 guys on the ice, a minimum at all times, and then when there's changes, there's like 13 or 14. Well, this has always right? bothered me. Why are linesmen only allowed to comment on major penalties or high-sticking? Every other sport, when it comes to the NFL, the NBA... Everyone with a whistle can make a call. In the NHL, yeah. only two guys who can yeah. see it can make the call, whereas a linesman might have clearly seen a trip. Oh, I'm not allowed to comment on two-minute penalties, only if it was a major, only if it was a too many men on the ice. That's yeah. so, I don't understand that. What 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 happens if, the, if this happens, all right? So last night, um, everything goes the way it did. Uh, Bozak trips Achari. Uh, Perron throws it in from the point. There's a puck battle. O'Reilly gets it. It gets back on David Perron's stri- uh, stick. He streaks towards the net, and the whistle goes. Because whistle. someone's in the ref's ear. Yep. And you, you say tough shit? Tough shit. People are going to be Don't frustrated because it was a late call, <laughs> and there's going to be boos, and it's going to be really frustrating. But I feel like if you really think about it, I'm like, well, they got it right. I mean, it was very clearly a trip. Like, I, mean, pretty- I bet you the Bruins would take it. <laughs> and believe yeah, me, would. I am the last person to be sympathizing with Bruins fans after the tirade <laughs> they went on against me earlier in April. What was that? When I said that Charlie McAvoy was really not a clean player because he does a bunch of things that are really oh, dirty. Hey, hey, I said that. Yeah. Well, it's weird. I got yelled at for that, too. And <laughs> so I'm the last Sorry. person to be sympathizing with the Bruins. But what happened last night is... Like you, it just can't happen. No, it the, just can't. The just just as bad as the Bozak one, I thought was well the shot that David Krejci blocked, with like a handful of seconds left shouldn't in the second. Even, yeah. yeah, shouldn't have even got there. Krug was like he was pra- <laughs> he was in an arm bar from yeah. Sunquist, and in the, uh, the the thing that kills me, stuff happens behind the play all the time. You're mm-hmm. not going to catch it all. Which is why you need the official, off right on, on the phone. But those two. Puck is right there. What are you looking at? Yeah. What are you looking at? I think it comes down to, again, what you were talking about, the fact that the Blues had taken, what, three penalties at that point? I'm not sure if they had at that specific point, but it's the same yes, idea. The fact that they they'd had taken had. significantly more penalties than Boston. Yeah. In your head, whether or not you're consciously thinking of it, we have a lot of evidence that shows that it's a factor, that you're subconsciously thinking about the fact that you need to even up these calls. So if the Blues, who have taken three, and the Bruins, who have taken one, if the Blues do something wrong... They're much less likely to get called for it. That should not be the case. Are refs thinking about it even more because of Craig Berube? Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. No, definitely. What did Craig Berube say? He went like he kind of compl- not kind of he complained he about complained. the officiating in ga- after game three. Three. They took fourteen penalties and, through the first three games. And be- essentially. According to Cassidy and a lot of people who've watched the series like way cl- more closely. You could tell that the officiating shifted after Barube said something publicly. You could tell that he that it had impacted what they were calling, and now it's sort of you get to the point where something like what happened in Game Five happens, and well, now the Blues are up three two with a chance to win the cup and on home ice on yeah. home ice because. An official didn't want to make a call for fear of the penalty discrepancy being four one. See, I so, liked, I kind of liked the calls in the first two games, and that yeah. like St. Louis was taking dumb penalties and they were getting called for it. I'm like, you don't want to be in the box. Don't do the don't take dumb penalties. And then you're being rewarded later on because oh, they we they took a lot of penalties earlier, so they shouldn't get as many in the future. That's never the way it should work. I just I'm such an advocate of call the rule book. If someone takes a penalty, it's a penalty. Well, this person took three penalties in a row. Guess what happens in the legal system? If if you do three <laughs> illegal things in a row, guess what? You get punished for it all three times. It's not like you get a get out of jail free card just because you took two penalties in the past. That's not how it works. Going into the game on Sunday, Barube yeah. said, I don't agree with all the calls. We were the least penalized team in the playoffs coming into this round. Now all these penalties. And then after last night, he says, I'm not here to judge the officials. He calls that. <laughs> They could have too. or couldn't have. They go both ways. We play a hard game. We're a physical team. We forecheck hard. I'll say it again. We're at least penalized team in the playoffs. End of story. Now back I don't to the first quote. Anymore back to the first quote. Back to the first quote on <laughs> Sunday. I don't agree with any of the calls. But I will not comment on them. <laughs> so so stu- and, uh, Two different sides to that. 
That's I, I, so hockey, though. Like, it's so <laughs> hockey. I'm not so sports fan. That's so, like... That's so biased, cheering for one team, thinking mm-hmm. that... Ev- like, you ever watched uh, a Raptors feed with Jack Armstrong? I love him to death. But oh. the Raptors are getting jobbed every game. <laughs> Man. <laughs> okay, last well, game. he hasn't been wrong when they've been playing LeBron, because yes. if you take a breath... Was the last time they LeBron? LeBron? <laughs> that was, like, a year ago? <laughs> last, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, last game, he, a, a Raptor took a foul and he called it a foul, I'm like, he must have smacked that oh guy my. in the face. Must have been a flagrant. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, the no. Raptors have never committed a foul in Jack That was their first one. That was the first one. Since 1995. Franchise is I love Jack Armstrong. He's like my favorite. But, you know, when you're biased and you're cheering yeah. for a team, you tend to see it through rose-colored glasses. And then when Definitely. the other team does something wrong, it's the worst thing that could have possibly happened. So See, like, I'm... So one of our family friends is a commentator for the Raptors. Oh, nice. And so I'm asking him, because I'm trying to learn, right? I go, so kid, what is, how is that not a foul? Or why is this a foul? And he said, honestly, Rachel, this is not the time to learn what is and what is not a foul because <laughs> I couldn't even tell you what they're calling. And I've been commentating on basketball for 30 years. I'm like, wow, that's really <laughs> well, alarming. The fouls on three-point shots in the NBA is a huge concern right now. It's yeah. something they're going to have to deal with in the offseason. We don't need to get deep into basketball talk right now, but it's like a James Harden thing where if you step back, and then shoot, but then your feet launch forward into somebody and you don't have the landing space. Is that a foul? Is it not a foul? Some guys get that call. Some guys don't get that call. It's a big gray area. But yeah, basketball officiating, I think, is much tougher than hockey officiating because there's so many hard calls. Like whether or not something was a block or a charge, were were his feet moving? Was he drifting a bit to the side? Did the player extend his arm fully or was it just a little half chicken wing? Half chicken wing isn't an offensive foul. Fully extending is an offensive foul. What do you call, and you got to do it in the moment like that. It's not easy, and that's why I don't get mad when a block charge doesn't go my team's way, because, shit, man, I was watching it live, and I have no idea what it was. (laughs) The one that kills me is when a defender jumps, they're in the air, and then the guy with the ball jumps into them, and all of a sudden, they're the ones shooting too? If your arms go straight up, they call it verticality. If your arms go straight up, Mm -hmm. and then the guy jumps into you, you as the defender with your arms up, no foul. But if your arms come out a little bit, and then you catch them on the wrist, or... The elbow, and all of a sudden he's off balance. That's a gray area. But, but isn't and it's, that like, like it's changing ridiculous. your path to skate over someone's stick and draw a trip? Yes. <laughs> like, it's much trickier oh, in the NBA. And in the NBA, it happens on almost every drive. In the NHL, how often do players get tripped or hooked? Like, I feel like it's much less common than in the NBA. That's why I feel like the NBA officials do a much better job and have a much tougher job. Than yes. NHL officials. And and all all three of them, it's three, right? Three. All three of them can make all the calls. Yep. Whereas hockey has four officials on the ice, but only two of them can make calls. Like it's we don't need I don't want the linesman's opinion on a delay of game penalty because personally I think that rule is stupid. <laughs> I want and I want if you have four officials on the ice, and I guarantee you at least one of them saw the Tyler Bozak trip, for example, or nope. One of them saw an, uh, the Cody Eakin thing. Nope. Give them the power to go, no, that's that's a penalty. like Or not a penalty kind of thing. Don't just have them stand there to call offside and icing and delay of game. Are they allowed to look up at the Jumbotron? I don't know, the, but they should. No, they're not allowed. They're not okay, allowed to base allowed. their judgment on it. I'm not sure if there's yeah. anything that says, hey, you're not allowed to look at the Jumbotron. I'm, sure, I'm 100% <laughs> sure they do it, but it's oh, they, not allowed. It should yeah. be, allowed. though. Go yeah. get a replay. Um, what should the NHL do this summer to fix this issue? Whew. Any ideas? Steve? Here we go. Just quit so we can all watch basketball, <laughs> I, I, I think is what they should do. No, um, I, I think some... Well, you know what they should do? Is they should go back and watch the entire playoffs. You got the whole summer. Kristen Shelton can go back and watch all 82 games of the 15-16 Toronto Maple Leafs. You can go back and watch. Why would she do that to herself? I know. <laughs> I know. No, because she had just gotten the job covering the Leafs, and she was like, "I'm, I'm gonna go back and see what they were last year." What a trooper. And you're like, "No, don't yeah. do that." This is why she's so much better at her job year. than we are. This just year. watch <laughs> Steve's LFRs. You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, everybody. From TSN especially, for sure. Brad Boys, P.A. Parento, Mark Arcabello. Oh <laughs> Who was the God. other guy the Leafs got in the Kessel deal? It was the, the Scott pick. Harrington? No. Oh, yeah. Eric Fair? No, he wasn't in that trade. Yeah. Yeah. These are Googleable things, no, Steve. Why I, are you asking? Because Kapanen, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to. A first-round pick, which ended up the being like the 30th overall The guy who they ended up trading pick. to San Jose. The guy they ended up trading to San Jose. I Maybe interview. it was Eric Fair. I don't I think even know it, it was. Part, he was part of that trade? No, Eric Fair was in the Corrado trade. <gasps> oh. Uh, right? Right? You, you're picturing right now. Do you want right me now. to tell you? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Jesse's got it. What, what yeah. is it? The Toronto Maple Leafs have traded Phil Castle. This is from Mike Johnston in July 1st, 2015. 
The Toronto Maple Leafs have traded Phil Kessel to the Pittsburgh Penguins. In return, Toronto gets center Nick Spalling. Ah! Nick Spalling! And forward Kasperi Gavin and defenseman Scott Harrington, plus first and second round picks from 2016. You remember that third line with Nick Spalling? Oh, God. Mm. Oh, I think they had a course here, like 40%. It was ah. great. How do you, how do you know that? Toronto how also you... set forward Tyler Biggs, a defenseman Tim Erickson, and a 2016 Noted second round pick first to round pick Pittsburgh. Pick with Ooh. truculence, Tyler mm. Biggs. Very good. Could have been Ricard Raquel and John Gibson, but they had to trade That's... up. That's great, man. Sorry. That's great. No, so uh, we're talking about officiating. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, they should, they <laughs> Much should go better back topic. and watch the whole Steve's going to start twitching. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't think they should be, like, too, too... This is going to sound stupid. I don't think they should be too, too hard on themselves because, honestly, they're going to... You're going to miss things. We yes, can. Adam sports. is a big proponent of human error. Yes. Um, the... The Sunquist one from last night and the Bozak one from last night, I just don't understand how you miss them. They're right there. They're right there in your face. And maybe I don't maybe you have an off ice official with a three Mississippi rule. Yeah. <laughs> or Rachel, like do you have that. any advice for Batman and the officials for this summer? I would say I like the off off ice official thing because I think the game is so fast and it's continuing to get faster. You can't add another official. I'd actually probably be a proponent of having one official on ice and the other one in the stands as opposed to, like, maybe three. So you go to, like, the one on ice and then the one off ice. Like you need the or you, two on either end, offensive end, defensive yeah, end. Yeah, or it's you hard. just add one for that end. I also think giving linesmen the ability to make the calls is will do because then you have four sets of eyes, right? So there's going to be a lot less that is missed because the whole video review thing like it go it gets thrown back and forth and like should it should you be able to review five minute majors potentially but i guarantee you if you have an extra official or an extra two sets of eyes that are already on the ice you probably won't even need video review because there's going to be a, two other sets of eyes for various things want to get nuts okay Let, let's get nuts okay so, oh, it was shoes or walnuts? Peanuts. Buddy. Peanuts. Yo, we are, the beer nuts. We are going Those are so good. <laughs> on this. Uh, <laughs> beer nuts are good. Beer nuts beer are nuts awesome. Yeah, they're so beer good. Thing. For sure. Remember when Jack Hasters was just a death trap? Because <laughs> it's just full of barrels of peanuts. Anyway, let's get nuts. <laughs> so, how many decades ago was it that the Montreal Canadiens ruined the league and made it so that penalties were not continuous? Four? Right? It was, was, that, it was, was like four years ago. Was the, the Rocket Richard one, or is that the no, was it no. John Beliveau? Uh, I want no. I feel like it was the. Like, I don't know. 70s? Jesse's on. It. It was you, a you, very, want, you want very two minute majors ago. back? You want nope. The opposite. So I think they're afraid to call penalties because, dude, it's two minutes. Like Jeff Merrick was on the radio today, and he did say the call the rule book. They'll adjust, but he also said, "How much of the game do you want played at five on four? They'll call more penalties. They'll call the rule book better if you introduce, let's get nuts, one minute penalties. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Why not? Why two? We've been married to two for decades. I like, I, two? I like that you're just asking questions and like trying not to be trapped in by tradition just for the sake of tradition. Though I, I'm all with yeah. you when it comes to that. But then don't, like, even if you score, it shouldn't end. One minute is one minute. You're shorthanded for one minute. And once you ice it, that's it. You know, hard that's, kind of, that's kind of why, like, if you ice it once... You know how hard it is to get a zone entry and so then set up a icing. formation? That takes, like, 30 seconds. That's a good one. Take away icing. You can't ice the puck on the penalty kill. I hate that. I think it's so silly. And that, so one minute of a PK where you can't ice it with four men. No, I don't think you should be able to ice it if you're killing a penalty <laughs> yeah, at all. Yeah, 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 where you're not allowed to ice it. You're not allowed, that's Ever. what I'm saying. And it's like basketball, if you do ice it, time gets put back on. Can I just say that? I don't think... <laughs> I, don't, I, don't see, I, don't yes! this, I don't see how this fixes the, the problem, though. Yeah, I think, this doesn't affect fix officiating. This might make power plays more interesting, but I don't know if it makes yeah, the think, overall problem... No, I think the official in the stands is probably... Or, like, okay. the official can on I, mic. Can I see something that might sound nuts? That might sound nuts relative to the problem? Not seeing. I'm not sure if individual officials are bad at their jobs. I don't think that they're missing the calls. I think that the bigger problem is systemic. It's a bigger problem based on the fact that makeup calls are seen culturally as something that should happen in the NHL. Mm. Whereas in other sports, particularly sports like the NBA, we see it as, oh, just because we got a call in the last possession doesn't mean we're getting a call in the next possession. Whereas in hockey, we tend to think that way. You know, we got a two-minute yeah. minor against us. Oh, we're getting a makeup call. Like, that was a bad call. We're getting a makeup call. Get rid of that entirely. Look at the 
research. I'd show a bunch of referees all the research over the last couple of years that shows that teams who have taken a previous call are much more likely to get the next call. The fact that teams getting two penalties in a row, three penalties in a row, four penalties in a row, in an all-luck world, that happens. Like, when it's 50-50, that should happen a few times. In the NHL, that almost never happens. Once one team takes two penalties, guess who's getting the next penalty? Was it you who made that chart? Um, it was, I mean, it must have been your Ian graph, but there, there was the, it was the penalties drawn and penalties taken graph. And it was basically, if you're along the, the diagonal line in the middle, you're even penalties taken and drawn. Yeah. And almost every they're team. They're like perfectly correlated. Yeah. With, <laughs> with the exception of like the ducks. You look for like the right best. on the line. Yeah. It's well, funny. the ducks was, are yeah. the ducks. So I wrote an article earlier in the year trying to figure out why are the Leafs never taking any penalties and never drawing any penalties? This is bizarre. Like and the they're way are the lower opposite. than and I'm and I was mm. tried to look at like the best ways of predicting future penalties drawn and future penalties taken. I was looking at anything I could find, whether it's okay, if a team has great possession metrics and they're in the offensive zone all the time, they should draw more penalties because you have the puck. You know, a team who has a lot of really fast skaters, you know, the Leafs, the Penguins, the Carolina Hurricanes, they play fast hockey. That that didn't really lead to any correlation. I'm like, well, crap, then what is it? And I just look at penalties taken, penalties drawn, damn near perfect correlation. So that it's, was you? Well, I, I don't know. There's a lot of people who write about this oh, kind okay. of stuff. Travis Yost has done a lot of great work in this area. There's yeah. um, some great stuff from 538. I think Michael Lopez did a great study on it one time. But basically, the best way to predict a future penalty drawn, who took the last one? That's the best way to predict it. And that's dumb. That's it's ridiculous. So dumb. They the even say they're like, one. keep your sticks down because the refs are looking at us for an even up call. What? Why? Maybe you should always Why? keep your stick down. Maybe yeah. never, Maybe don't slash a guy in the face. You know, <laughs> Ryko Gudis, just don't do it. <laughs> Man. It needs Future a leaf. full overhaul. Future leaf. But... Uh, you know what? I was, I was, man, I was on that train and then seeing him play, what, what was it, at the World Championship? When he like gooned Claude Giroux, his own captain, I'm like, <laughs> yes, no, this guy can't a, help that himself. That sounds like there. something he could do. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's he's out of his. But mind. yeah, I think the deeper issue here is the fact that the the makeup call and the the idea that you need to even things up and mm-hmm. oh the referees don't want to um, you know let the let the players decide let's let the players decide we don't want to decide the outcome of the game if you're gonna let the players decide you have to call the rules because if you're mm-hmm inflating the penalty calls for one team and deflating them for another team, you're not letting the players decide. You're dictating the outcome of the game by bending the rules for one team and not for another team. That's not fair. Call the rule book and let's look at the research and let's make sure that we're actually calling these penalties as they should be in an all luck world. And I feel like the league needs to, get, needs to get really involved and make it priority number one next year when it comes to, okay, has this team, how, how do I word this? There shouldn't be as many games where both teams have an equal amount of penalties or both teams have a similar amount of penalties. There should be games where one team has three and the other team has zero. There should be games... Or eight, four. Yeah, that, those should happen, and they don't. And the fact that they don't is indicative of a bigger problem. So I feel like they need to get much closer to the way that it should be as opposed to the way it is right now where everything's evened up regardless of whether or not yeah. one team's playing dirty and the other's playing clean. The it's Ducks, frustrating. The Ducks took more... Then they drew. You know why? The ducks suck. <laughs> that's why. That's why. And that's how it should have been. People were saying about the Leafs, though, their style of play doesn't invite it. What? Yes, it does. Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews' style doesn't invite you to hack and slash at their life? You what what the, are you talking about? Look at the about? players who lead the league in penalties drawn. It's McDavid, Barzal, Goudreau, yeah. Nick Ehlers. It's the speedy guys you can't keep up with, and you have to hook, and you have to trip. And McDavid is an interesting example because he should be drawing more. Like every the shift. Most, way, way more. <laughs> the most penalties. That guy gets literally assaulted every shift. Think and of the call, NBA. Like the guys, one of every five. The best yeah. player at drawing fouls. I mean, let's leave James Harden out of this for a minute because he's a bit frustrating. But the best players at drawing fouls are guys who are always going to the basket and you can't stop. Giannis Antetokounmpo is a goddamn like freak when it comes to his arms are crazy long. Mm. He can euro step from the three point line and dunk it. You have to follow <laughs> that dude, especially when he's airballing his free throws. <laughs> that was one of the most bizarre things yeah. I've ever seen in my entire life. But the fact that he, I'm not sure if he led the league in free throw attempts, but he was high up there as he should be because he's I a really he good player. The best players at breaking down defenses and getting into open space are getting hacked. So guess what? The players who lead the league in that category, the most skilled, fast players who are really mm-hmm. good at breaking down defenses and, oh crap, I don't have the foot speed. I'm going to have to hook and slash and hack you. Those are the players who should be leading the league in penalties drawn. And I feel like it's weird when you look at certain teams like Carolina never draws any penalties. And I'm like, well, shouldn't Sebastian Ajo be drawing a lot of penalties? That guy's really good. Or I watch uh, Evgeny Svechnikov. Or is it Evgeny or Andre? Andre. Andre. 
Uh, me too. They dude. always, uh, <laughs> yeah. always get them confused. <laughs> Evgeny Svechnikov, he's just a bulldozer going to Andre. the net. And the amount of like Same slashing thing. and hooking and... I call him Evgeny again? Yeah, yes. you did. Same thing. <laughs> That Sveshnikov guy in Carolina, <laughs> he's a good player. Yeah. When he's going to the net, he's dealing with so much hacking and slashing, and it's like, man, imagine if it, he was on another team, he'd probably be getting those calls. But Carolina's such a clean team, they never take any penalties, so they don't draw as many as they probably should, and the Leafs are in a similar situation where they'd weirdly be better off taking dumb penalties under this current system. Aradko Gudas would weirdly really help the Leafs because his dumb penalties <laughs> yeah. would lead to Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews and Morgan Riley actually drawing more penalties. So the, it's the so ridiculous. Get a guy who takes lots of penalties so that they could get more power Under plays. this current system, oh my God. that's how it works. That's how ridiculous the system is. The fact it's that that's so a sentence. Dumb. Yo, Mason Marchman 2020, let's go. I'm not even lying. Gonna... It would help you. If you want more power plays... Take more penalties. It's ridiculous. That's and brilliant. Until, until that sentence no longer exists, like this is just the way the game is. It's so frustrating. That's brilliant. Can I ask a non-officiating question? Sure. <laughs> How much of the uh, the Blues 3-2 series lead has to do with Jordy Biddington? 17 saves in the first. Uh, he's 59 of 62 since game three. He can wow. be the first ever rookie to win all 16 games for a Stanley Cup winning team. No, Cam Ward didn't win all 16? Uh, no, he'll be the first rookie ever. Uh, to I win thought all Cam 16. Ward was rookie that year, no? He, w- he was. Martin Gerber might have won one of the oh, games. Okay. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, and then you had Matt Murray in Pittsburgh, who was ironically a rookie both but years. Yeah, he played Flurry some games in there. In there. Same yeah. with uh, but, when Ken Dryden and Patrick Wall both did it as rookies, but they I don't didn't think win there all 16. Were, I don't think there were four rounds wow. at and that no, time. No, no that. see, I think. How much is this? Bennington. He was great last night. He definitely held the fort because Boston doubled St. Louis in shots. Yeah. Um, I think that he, he's he been good. He hasn't been... I think Tuka Rask has been better in the playoffs. Can you look up Bennington's save percentage so far in the entire playoffs? Um, like like Tuka Rask has made more yeah. timely saves. Oh, Tuka, there it is. Timely saves. Mm. Big stat. That's, that's my key metric for goalies. <laughs> Tuka Rask has made more saves, I believe, from in like in the danger area, the high danger shots, uh, last time I checked. And I just, St. Louis's system doesn't lend itself to giving up the chances that require the 10 bell saves. Like uh, pre shot movement, like cross slot yes. passes in they the offensive don't, zone. Yeah. yeah, they don't allow that. So I think Bennington has made the saves that he needs to make, but by no means has he been at the level that Marc Andre Fleury was last year. And San Jose could have really used a guy like Jordan Bennington or or like, anybody or Jimmy Howard or any goalie at the deadline. That that still bothers me. Either goalie the Leafs gave up on waivers. Mark like, Jones was <laughs> so bad in the playoffs, and they made it as far as they did. I thought it's, he was half decent as. I thought he was really good in that Vegas series. He yeah. had a couple big games. He had a couple big games. Then I was like, yeah, after costing them some. Yes. <laughs> like, he was terrible earlier in that but that's And 9-13, by the way. 9-13 for Bennington yeah, in the playoffs so, so far? Not... Is that even league average in the playoffs? I don't know. Uh, and well, and keep in mind, 9-13 after last night, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so he's probably 9-09, 9-10 going in. Yeah, he... Last, that's, that's not, not bad. that good. That's not bad, but that's not no. dragging your team like Tuka Rask was, where that's not Carolina couldn't score on him at all. It was St. ridiculous. Louis yeah. desperately yeah. needed a stolen game. And they, and they can. Night. Very considered game five, that yeah. stolen game. Even even in game three where they got completely filled. The weird thing about the NHL is that sometimes goalies just do that. Sometimes goalies yeah. just steal a game. What was the backup goalie on the Rangers this year? What the hell was his name? Georgia. That... Georgia. Yeah. He did it twice. Who is that guy? Like, look at his save percentage could. this year. You know well, who made His like save percentage 50? was like below 9-10. He wasn't a good goalie. And then all of a sudden against the Leafs, he's prime hashik. Mm. <laughs> like, sometimes goalies get really hot, really cold. And hockey's a weird sport sometimes. It's all who between the years. Who made 50 saves? 50 saves in the playoffs for the Avalanche last year. Andrew Hammond. My boy. That's yeah. not The real. Hamburger. The Hamburger. It's a thing that, that was happened. That's the only game they won. Right? Look at all of and the won. stats that yeah, you're in Ottawa where he won like I think it 18 of the last 20 or whatever it Insane. was. It was, it was absurd. Yeah. I want to say 21 and 1. It was something ridiculous. That's, I don't know what yeah. it was. It was something insane. But yeah, t- I would say that Ra- Rask is more to do with Boston's success mm-hmm. than Bennington is to do with and You know what's funny success. is I always thought Rask was overrated. I always felt like Boston's system did an excellent job of suppressing those dangerous ch- chances that we're talking about. And that Rask, even though he had a high save percentage, you look at the expected save percentage, he was actually a little bit below it because right. Boston was always so good at limiting those dangerous chances. This playoff run, Rask was playing outside of his mind. This is the best hockey I think he's ever played in his life. Yep. And it's coming in his like mid thirties. This isn't what's supposed to happen for goalies. It's weird. It's killing me. Man. He was picked the year before my draft year. 
He was, I think. He was picked by the Who Leafs. Who was he picked Just by? Just throwing that out there. Just, uh, um, uh, the Habs. Yeah. Huh. I think this is the longest we ever talked about the uh, Stanley Cup Finals. <laughs> yeah. And I since know. it's we been could, on. All right, let's talk about Zaitsev. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my God, no. Uh, <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Sorry. I think we are. You, Sorry, I meant Marlowe. Sorry, I meant Marlowe. Sorry, I meant... No, I, uh, I meant David, Damon Severson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I meant. Rachel's that's, not allowed to say a word now. She's that, yeah, going to go meant. mute. You're right, I'm <laughs> sorry. Okay, anyway, so uh, the Taylor Hall comments. Uh, we should really, we should talk about those. Taylor and Hall. It, yeah, Who was the first that. overall pick this year, Rachel? <laughs> Who should it be? Or yeah. who will it be? Oh, no, I just mean which team has it and uh, oh, who, New what are they going to use it on? Oh, okay, just, just yeah, because they didn't make the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> oy, oy, oh, hey, hey, is... listen. Hey, I'm hold, sorry, I'm hold, sorry. Hey, We're hey. spitting facts here. Uh, this whoa. show is about facts. Yeah. Wow. Know the facts. Know the facts. This is, it's facts and graph. <laughs> facts and graph. <laughs> so uh, for the second half of the show, can we do something a little different? No. Can we do... And that's the end of the show. Something we've never done before. Was that? Can Raptors we talk entirely Saturday. about the Leafs? <laughs> I, I have we about, never get to do this. Absolutely, I'm so the Leafs. In. I have about eight-ish Leafs questions. That's okay, great. Let's do it. We're gonna do a little, little roundtable on Leafs. Sure. Some right, Leafs. Right. Then maybe end it with some Raptors. Sure. We, we, can go can more we don't get to we talk about the I, Leafs I, on our podcast. So. <laughs> no, not at all. No, because it's like a. We try to not make it Leafs oriented in our podcast. Leafs geeks, the one I do, it's all Leafs all mm -hmm. the time, except when I do a Raptors yeah. episode. Like someone got mad week. at me because I said, uh, like, I used Mitch Marner as a comparison instead of Braden Point, and I was like, well, I was comparing wingers, so I don't know if you're Could've paying attention. Could have but... gone Rantanen. But... You say that too much. Someone got mad at me because who, who cares? <laughs> someone got mad. Of course they did. <laughs> Of course, they did. <laughs> of course they did. Of course they did. Our first because question we... comes from Adam Wild. Who? Uh, some guy. Adam. He says, "Ask Rachel about New Leafs assistant head coach Steve McFarland, <laughs> <laughs> which is not his name. What is his correct name, Rachel? Paul McFarland. Paul, Paul <laughs> McFarland. He will head up the new power play next year. Who is he? What do you know about him, Rachel? Go ahead." Uh, so, Paul McFarland, when I was back working with the Wolves, he was the head coach of the Kingston Front Acts. And um, I specifically remember a game where we were playing Kingston and uh, the Front Acts scored five power play goals against us. Jeez. And I was like, oh dear, this is a power play. And Kingston wasn't, they weren't the juggernaut team of that year. It wasn't like they were loading up for Memorial Cup, but their power play was just insane so I always remembered I'm like man like this guy is he's doing some cool stuff on the power play then he got hired in Florida and last season I did like a study where I used a bunch of behind the scenes stats and just a lot of I watched every single minute of Florida's power play for the first half of the season so that was not this past season but a season ago no this past season oh this most recent one yeah okay. so if you there's obviously power play percentage but then there's Sport Logic has a stat where it's uh, scoring chances per two minutes on the power play. So and what's considered a scoring chance with a, their data? A, a, like a, a shot from the slot, essentially. Okay. Or or a deflection. They have their algorithm definition. Okay. Or um, like a, a, a pass that goes through the slot, even if it's from a bit farther. Yes. The fact that it went through the slot, slot made it a scoring chance. If it chance. has something to do with the slot, or it's a rebound chance. Basically, like, if it has like over a 20% chance of going in, give or take. Yeah. Um, their Tampa generated the most scoring chances per two minute. That's weird. Florida was second. I thought the Leafs were second, no? No, Florida was second, the Leafs were third, and Ooh. the Sabres were fourth. Yeah, Leafs were third? Yeah. I thought so, they were second. Yeah, so the Leafs. Look at the stats. The Leafs generated a so, crazy amount of no, shots no, no, from no, the dangerous it, this areas. This is per two minutes. Yeah. So the Leafs had... The Leafs generated more chances than the Panthers, but the, the Leafs had more... Or may have been reversed. But... It was, it's per two minutes. Yeah, I always go per 60. That's always kind of what yeah, I do. Yeah, see, like on the power play, yeah. they do per 20 or per two. It ends up being the same because thing. It's, per it's just depending what you yeah, divide it by. Exactly. But, yeah. but Florida yeah. actually generated a bunch of scoring chances. And that was because, one, they played their top guys. So Barkoff, Huberto, um, Trocek when he was Mike wasn't Hoffman hurt. was the trigger what? man. They, they, <laughs> Mike Hoffman, they played those guys for like a minute and a half of the power play. Can I tell you guys a fun story? You know what they started off at the beginning of the year with? They tried five forwards on the power play. 
Bingo. So Ooh. that's what I was getting it, at. He's it actually didn't so end up working innovative. too well, but I love the fact that they tried it. Yeah. Innovation in the NHL typically isn't something we see. You know, creativity, innovation gets you fired, but this guy was trying something new in Florida. <laughs> it didn't work. They ended up going with Keith Yandel at the point because he's, he's actually a, a better point man when it comes to walking the line and doing that space. But I love the fact that he tried something new that other teams weren't trying. See, I wouldn't be surprised if this is because Paul, he's a very young guy. I think he's like 34, I want to say. Um, He's not afraid to be innovative and try new stuff. So I wouldn't be shocked to see a power play where it's Morgan Riley at the point, and then it's Matthews, Marner, Tavares, and... You can get Nylander out there? Like Nylander. And they run for a minute and a half. I'm wondering if there's a way to get Nylander out there with Matthews, Tavares, and Marner, because I feel like if you can find a way to make it work... And I, you're not going to be able, like, you're not going to find a team with more so skill on their prepared. power play. C- can I suggest something? Go ahead. So one one reason why I think Babcock sometimes uh, didn't let the first line fly for as long is the top three centers were on it, right? And so what happens if you don't score? Then you're what are you throwing out, Freddie the Goat? Okay, this always you're bothers me. Okay, unit? so with this argument, think about it. Every team has a power play one and a power play two. Yeah. So of two minutes, you're all three of your top three centers will be on the ice. Because yes. if your top three centers aren't on PP1 or PP2... They're bad. Yeah, you're not going to go very right. far because, <laughs> man, your centers are garbage. But if you have... So you're, let's say your top two centers are on PP1 and your third center's on PP2. Who do you think's coming over the boards right after the penalty? Well, it's not going to be one, the, your number one or number two center. They're still tired. It's not going to be your number three center. He was just on the ice. Every team in the league has their fourth liners or their grinders or their defensive players on the ice immediately after a power play. You go around the league, it's yeah. always the grinders. And the Leafs, who is it? It's Hyman, it's... who they, else? Is... They had a weird line. It was basically Connor the fourth Brown, line except... Hi- they... Hyman, Marlo, Connor Brown. Yeah. Cappy. Like... But yeah, the thing with Paul McFarland is he's not afraid to be different. And that's what I think needs... The Leafs need. They need someone who's not afraid to be different. He has no qualms with trying five guys. He has no qualms with putting four guys on one side of the ice to overload and then moving the puck and moving it back because it gets the heads turning, it gets the goalie's head turning. It totally, it screws with the D because his big thing is you got to create two-on-ones. That's how you generate scoring chances by creating mini two-on-ones all around the ice. And that's what he focuses on doing as opposed to just passing and, and whatever. It's With him, it's more about the way you create scoring chances, which is his power plays are very good at is by creating odd man situations all over the ice. So if you watch what Florida's power play did last year, they used the points, they used a lot of movement, but it was all about creating those odd man opportunities so that they could create a scoring chance. So I think we'll see that with the Leafs, especially like with the the amount of skill that they have. Um, it'll be it'll be fun. I think especially at the beginning of the year because That's, no one will know what to do. I love the point you make about creating two on ones. Even when you're watching just regular 5 and 5 hockey, the best players in the world are the ones who are able to turn um, a one on one situation or let's say the other team has two guys. If you can escape that and then get the puck up to your players, now all of a sudden one player has a has a two on one situation or one player is going to have more open space. Jake Gardner on the breakout when he shake and bakes a four checker and then gets the yep. puck up to a forward. Now it's four forwards on three players, and now someone's going to have a two-on-one situation. You want to break down the defense. Same thing on the power play. When you're Mitch Marner on the wall, and no one's committing to you, okay, I'm going to skate into traffic, I'm going to skate in until someone commits to me. Now I'm going to feather it over to Matthews. Oh, he's open. Two commit to him. He backdoors it to Tavares. Open net. You're always trying to make two-on-one situations. On the breakout, on the break-in, in the offensive Everywhere. zone when you're creating offense. Try to create two-on-ones in hockey. It's such a great point. And the better teams at doing that on the power play, Tampa Bay is probably the gold standard. Oh, God, yeah. The way that they're able to move that puck around and just create open space for their players, that's why they scored a ridiculous amount of goals this year. Because Kucherov, Stamkos, Hedman, Braden Point, it's just not fair. They were like point three scoring chances better than yeah. the second-place team, which is absolutely <laughs> insane. Yeah. Oh, my God. Nuts. Can I ask a, a side question? Do mm-hmm. we, because you guys are much smarter than me and you know about this stuff, do we get too caught up in five-on-five five points? Because uh, I've obviously been obsessing over the Leafs prospects because uh, it's the off season and I have nothing else to do. And I've seen a lot of talk about Jeremy Bracco and the season he had, and it was really, really good, but one of the criticisms is too many of his points come on the power play. And I look at the Leafs this year and I'm like, well... They could use that. That sounds exactly like the sort of player they could use. So do we get too caught up in the whole making sure a player is good five-on-five thing? I think yes and no. I think for Jeremy Bracco, on a team like the Leafs, 
I don't think he's set up to have success, at least to maximize his potential, because I feel like what he is as a player is just a ridiculous passer. Just an right. unbelievable passer. Um, I don't think he's the greatest defensive player in the world. I'm not no. saying he's bad. I'm just saying that's not his strength. He's not like a Ryan O'Reilly type of player. He hangs his hat on his passing ability. He's not going to win a lot of one-on-one puck battles. He's not the strongest player in the world. He is going to quarterback a power play, feather those saucer passes to the slot, even 5-on-5. Five five, he's going to get the zone entry, stay to the outside, look for a feather pass to the slot. And then when the other team gets the puck, He's not the greatest player. That He's not the guy you want on your team. The second you lose the puck, I want a Ryan O'Reilly on my team. I want a Jordan Stahl on my team. Casper Kapanen on the back check. You know, sign me up. Jeremy Brack, when my team doesn't have the buck, not the, one of the first guys who comes to mind. So I think when it comes to driving play, I'm not sure how great Brack is going to be, but when it comes to creating offense and creating offense on the power play, that has a lot of value on almost any team. The hard part with the Leafs, we talked about it. You can run a power play with Marner, yeah. Matthews, Tavares, Nylander, Riley. Brack was going to be on PP2. And as we were talking about this year, the second unit power play should almost never play yeah. when you have guys that are that good. Look at Washington. Ovechkin spent over 80% of his minutes on the power play. Backstrom spent like wow. 75% of the, the power play time. Yeah. On the ice for PP1. And Ovechkin's not even breaking a sweat. And that's the thing. So, yeah, maybe he takes four yeah, strides. Yeah. He takes yeah. four strides. That's the smart thing. I think that's how they should use Matthews, is just keep him there, stand him there, don't make him involved in the break and then you can stay there for the full two minutes. But that's an aside. With Bracco, on a team like the LA Kings, on a team like the Carolina Hurricanes, on a team who really needs some power play help, uh, hell, the Nashville Predators could really use some, yep, that's some power play help say, right yeah. now. Brack will be incredible because he can quarterback your power play and then maybe shelter him at 5-on-5, five five, play him with a shooter, get him lots of ozone starts. That can be a very valuable player. I think as much as we hate him as a human being, I'm thinking of Mike Ribeiro in terms of like that's the kind of player he was. Mm-hmm. He was good on the power play. He was a good offensive player. Wasn't that great defensively, but you love him because of his passing ability. Jeremy Brackle kind of reminds me of that. But on the Leafs, your right wing side is Marner, yeah. Nylander, Kapanen. Assuming Kapanen is still with the team this season. Assuming I, I Marner's think, still with the team. Jesus Christ. <laughs> $50 million offer sheet from Arizona. I have a feeling that might be one of the we'll seven remaining um, questions. Okay, but, but, <laughs> but my point, to answer Steve's question about... But, but yeah. Just to quickly finish up there, sorry. That's my point right. is that he looks like he's going to have to play fourth line at 5-on-5 five five and second unit power play maybe, what, 30 seconds yeah. every two minute power plays? That's not going to get the most out of Jeremy Brackle on the Leafs, so I don't think he's as valuable to the Leafs as he is to a team like Nashville, like uh, like the teams I mentioned, uh, mm-hmm. Carolina, New Jersey might be able to use him, wink, wink. Um, <laughs> but And Levo couldn't even satisfy Babcock and that's on the, the ho- fourth line. Exactly. I don't know how so, going to do so it. So I don't think power play yeah. value is, is not a thing, because I think power play value is incredibly important. If you look at the teams who have lots of success, you need to have a good power play. But... For players who aren't the dynamic superstar first-line players, for guys who aren't the top 10 picks, for guys who aren't expected to be big-time producers, you need to be do, you need to do things other than the power play. And that's where 5-on-5 five five play is extremely important. Can you back-check? Can you win puck battles? Can you advance the puck up the ice with possession? Can you generate offense at 5-on-5? Five five? Because as much as we love Bracco at 5-on-4, five he's not the same kind of player at 5-on-5. Five five. He's not a top-line right. player at 5-on-5. Five five. He might be a middle-six guy at 5-on-5, five five, but... You know, on the Leafs, where is he going to fit in? Probably on the fourth line and probably on second unit power play. That's why I think it makes sense to trade him this offseason, maximize the asset. But I'm, I'm curious as to what you think about 5-on-4 five versus 5-on-5 five five when it comes to evaluating prospects. Yeah, I think it's pretty difficult because the AHL, you have a mix of young players and then like older jungle players. Like the veterans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And so it's just, there's a lot going Like you have... Players like Jeremy Bracco, but then you also have players like Colin Greening. Yeah. Two very different styles of ben player. Ben Smith the year before. Ben Smith. Um, so for me, five on five points, I don't know that I would look at as heavily. I would look at driving play. So with Bracco, for example, you are a player who is a passer. Now, okay, if scoring... I'm looking at your five on five points. Like if you're a goal scorer, you're supposed to be a goal scorer in the NHL. I'm looking at your points. You care more about goals than assists. Uh, yes. Interesting. Okay. Um, however, when it comes to a player who's known for puck movement, I'm more looking at the driving play factor. So how many shot assists does he have? That's a big one. How many mm. uh build up plays? Like Ryan Stimson does excellent work on build up plays. It's how very many... similar from soccer analysis. That's the big thing is yeah. build up play, getting for, the play up the field. For Ian's basketball love, if anyone has seen me while watching a soccer game, I am a complete lunatic. 
not only am I analyzing the game, but like I'm just a psychotic fan. It's, it's she's wearing a TFC that. jersey right now. <laughs> I'm wearing a, a Raptors jersey. Yeah, you're you're soccer crazy. I'm basketball crazy. But anyway, so back to the the five on five thing. I think it's more. It depends on what you're evaluating. I don't think that every player should be evaluated by the same thing because all players aren't the same. So. If I'm evaluating a score, so let's say Cole Caulfield gets drafted and a year from now he's playing in the AHL. 53rd overall. I am <laughs> I am evaluating his 5-on-5 five five points and his power play points because I'm bringing him up to score. That's why I His job him. is going to be to put the puck in the net. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm evaluating. But for Jeremy Bracco, his job, or a passer, or a defenseman, your job is not to score. So what else are you doing? I, you care about right. Bracco's, how often is he exiting the zone, zone. with possession? With, how often he's, he's entering, entering the, the zone, zone with possession? possession. So making passes stats. to the middle of the slot, passes from behind the net that connect and lead to a shot. Exactly. So yeah. there's different stats that I'm looking at. And same for a defenseman. Like I don't care how many 5-on-5 five five points Rasmus Sandin has yep. if I'm Leafs management. I really don't. I same. care about his controlled entry against. I care it is how many, like, his breakout percentage, I care about, like, things that make you a defenseman hmm. rather than, oh, his five-on-five points are this or his power play points are this, so he's not ready. Like, to me, to loop everything into the same bucket is totally asinine. For defensemen, I'd make a big argument that five-on-five points are almost irrelevant when it comes to evaluating their play because you might be more involved with the offense. If you're always involved with play in junior, for example... And you're always leading the rush, and you're always getting a lot of points. Like, for example, a Mac Hallwell, who I really like, got a ton of 5-on-5 five five points this year because he was basically their best player, so he was just initiating all the offense for the Sioux Greyhounds. But that, to me, isn't as important as who was driving play the best, who was moving the puck out of their zone with possession, right. leading to controlled entries, who was doing a really good job of um, controlling their gap in transition, forcing you to dump it in, who's winning the one-on-one puck battles, who's stopping the cycle, who's doing all the little things that result in your team having the puck and the other team not having the puck. And that's why, at the end of the day, we like these shot metrics because they're really good. They, they give a good indicator of all these things. Individually, we can assess, are you moving the puck well? Are you controlling your gap well? Are you winning the one-on-one battle well? Which, but, if you're an NHL team looking at your prospects, you should be no, looking at those absolutely. individual stats. Absolutely. But if you're doing all those things well... It should lead to you out shooting, out chancing, yes. and over a large sample, out scoring the opposition. Out shooting, out chancing in smaller samples, like one or two seasons, is what we'll look at. Over five, six years, and you're, you should be outscoring someone. But that's why we care a lot about shot metrics. And that's why when you see a prospect who has is a great offensive player, but when he's on the ice, his team's getting out shot, out chanced, and out scored. I don't know, Ryan Merkley. Like, I like your offense, I like your dynamic skill, but. You need to do more than just score offensively to be an effective player in the modern game. How was that for a first question? <laughs> I'm going to ask question number two. <laughs> this is his so. third question of the podcast. The first one was about officiating. <laughs> All right, let's do, uh, let's do a quick Chris, answer on this one. Kristen <laughs> Shilton wrote a great article this week on Marley's Who Could Be Leafs Next Year. It included Lilligren, Sandine, Engvall, Korshkov. Ooh, I think there should be a couple other ones. I, think I was going to say should Marchman. Be Marchman should be up there. <laughs> Out of those four, anybody want to add, who do you see coming up next year and being a regular in the lineup? Steve, you want to go first? I think Babcock, uh, during um, the preseason, is going to fall in love with Mason Marchman. He might have this year had uh, Marchman not been injured, right? Right. He was injured. so He had surgery in the offseason. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say Mason... Marchment. Left wing on the fourth line. I could definitely yeah. see him providing some value there. Oh, yeah. 100%. Power play in front of the net on PP2, too. The PP2, yeah. I was going to say, PP1? What are you talking no, about? Absolutely <laughs> not. I, was, um, I, was I, I think Sorry. that um, both Lilia Gurn and Sandine get a look. Not mm-hmm. maybe, maybe not right out of camp, but certainly at some point this year. I could see both of them getting sort of the Travis Dermott treatment. Um, and do you think they stick? See, that's the thing. It depends on the summers they have. Because. I thought Sandine was brilliant this year. Yeah. Like, he's close. When, yeah. I think when, he's close. When the Leafs were losing players in the playoffs, and they're like, who are they going to call up? My first thing was, I get he's young, but I would be calling up Sandine because that's your best option right now. I don't want to see whomever else is down there. Like To me, it wouldn't shock me if both Sandine and Lilia Grin get that look. One, unless the Leafs do something they're a mess on the right-hand side, especially if they get rid of Zaitsev. Um, and so if Zaitsev's gone and there's no help brought in, I think potent- one, if not both, 
stick. I think if I Zaitsev's think, gone and they don't replace him with anyone, I think I, I don't see how you do that in the offseason. You got to bring in someone. You, you think right? You would whether it's a Colin have Miller to. or whether it's like like there are options out there. Um, mm. I don't think Korshkov's quite ready yet. Um, he just came over. Yeah. Um, Reminds although, me of Engvall. Like I feel like he needs at least a year or maybe yeah. even two in the AHL. I, I think get that he's Engvall older. gets platoon minutes next year, so he he's the up and down guy. He gets mm-hmm. yo yo at center or wing. Both. Ooh, okay. Ooh, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. he's the future replacement for Freddie the Goat. Interesting. Because I think he's better. Well, yeah. Uh, hey, hey, we love Freddie the Goat here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, do, why do the Leafs have Nick Patan? I why, forgot why do about him. Why do they have him? Yeah, he's well, not. I think Babcock du- doesn't like him. Well, yeah, but Dubis does. I think that's so what, what it comes down to. He likes having skill. He likes having mm. skill on all four lines. Because you, at the end of the day, Kyle has the ability to take the toys away. Hmm. <laughs> I guess. And, um, yeah. To answer yeah, the question think, for Sandy and Lilligren, I think when you look at the Leafs depth chart right now, um, Riley, Muzzin, uh, Dermott, and I think Rosen has earned a spot on the yep. third pairing next Agreed. year. That's the hard part. So those are four left-handed defense. One of them has to play the right side, much to Mike Babcock's chagrin. And then you need to fill in two right-handed defenseman spots. I'm assuming Zaitsev's traded. And I'm assuming Ron Hainsey isn't back, but there's talk that he might be back. That might be another. Do you trust Babcock to not play him 27 minutes a night? Well, not 27, but like I don't trust Babcock to play Ron Hainsey on the third pairing for 82 games. That's what is what it comes down to for me, and that's why personally I wouldn't re-sign Ron Hainsey, even though I'd love him in that role. I just on the third line. Yeah, on the third third pairing. Yeah, third pairing. Whether it's with Rosen or a Dermot, I'd love that. But I just don't trust that that he's going to play there. Don't trust. I think Travis Dermot should play almost all of next season on the second pairing. I feel like he's earned it at this point. And when he's healthy, he's excellent. In the playoffs, he wasn't healthy. His shoulder was injured. Like you said, it hurt for him to make a pass. Like it was just, Mm. dude. Dude was not himself. I could see Jake Gardner coming back next year. It wouldn't shock me. There are a lot of things for the pure reason that Tyler Ennis was here this year. The medical staff. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I was actually going to say I could see Tyler Ennis coming back. As yeah. Well. But here, basically, my argument here is that it's going to be hard for Sandy as much as I think he might be ready. A lot of left-handed defense with, with Lilligren, his path is easier. So let's say yes. Sandy is 100% ready and Lilligren's 90% ready. I still think Lilligren has an easier window onto a third-pairing right D spot with Callie Rosen, who he's played with before at the mm-hmm. AHL level, to come up and play a few games. Whereas with Rasmus Sandy, when you're calling him up, I feel like you need to be ready to just put him in there and play him there. So, so maybe you wait till January and you're very confident in how he's playing and there's an injury and you go, all right, this is the time where we call up Rasmus Sandin. He's our third pairing defense when he's going to be there the rest of the season. Doesn't Sandy? doesn't Keith play Sandin with Lilligren though? So one of them is playing the right-hand side. So no, Lilligren's right-handed. Okay, so why, like, I don't understand. I get the whole left-handed thing, but you can't tell me. Like, I've watched Rasmus Sandin play. You can't tell me he's not capable. First of all, Travis Dermott played his entire minor hockey career on the right-hand side, so now he's been moved over to the left D all of a sudden. I don't quite understand that one. Well, handedness is an issue that we could definitely talk about. I feel like that's like another <laughs> podcast in I, itself. But I'd love to <laughs> them just play their six best defensemen. That'd yeah, be that'd be awesome. great. That'd be great. And Dermot's missing the beginning of the season too, right? Um, mm. I think he'll be ready. Steve, you de- you've defended handedness before. Uh, have I? I think, I, um, well, okay. At least the reasoning Jake that they have right? behind it. No, he doesn't. Babcock, Jake Muzzin done or was last he with no Martinez? Alex, Alex Martinez plays the Why can't one they co- trade for him? Conversation. That was rumored. <laughs> Steve, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, there's two points. Yeah, what, what conversation? Well, ba- yes. Babcock's been a stickler for the whole right versus left thing. Um, except for, no, he hasn't. Like, ever. At any point during his Leafs uh, coaching career. What ways Ron Hainsey shoot? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He hasn't given a shit. But... How many times, uh, there were so many times last year where the puck goes to the point and Ron Hainsey's got to handle it on his backhand and it's that split second that screws everything It's up. a really hard play to make, even for an incredibly skilled player. Why wouldn't you yeah. put Riley on the right? He's clearly the better defenseman. The argument is that you're, it's much easier to break out on your strong side. And so Riley if Riley's out. the main puck mover and Ron, and Ron Hainsey isn't, you want to... Hainsey to just quickly reverse the puck to Riley, who's now on his strong side, to get out of the zone. I understand that argument. Yeah. But if you look at Vegas, they played Nate Schmidt on his wrong side. He's a left-handed defenseman playing the right. And Braden McNabb playing his left. Braden McNabb's a good defensive player, not a great puck mover, kind of like a Ron Hainsey. And mm-hmm. instead of having the great puck mover on his strong side, they put the great puck mover on his wrong side. Because Nate Schmidt has incredible edges, can turn laterally. Yeah. is more, I don't know, he's, he's able to creatively maneuver his way out of the zone despite being on his offside, and I think that's what they liked about it. Bad I'd, taste in meat. I'd, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but 
I don't know. I'd make the argument that I, I'd still like to see the Muzz and Riley pairing again, man. I feel like it was good and it was bad for one game and then they went away from it forever. And I would still think that those two can make some magic happen again. Can I make a suggestion? Enough of this shit. Get a good right-handed defenseman. That, no, that's, that's, that would be awesome. Yeah. That would yeah. be great. Well, How I'm many like, years have we been saying that for? I'm not even saying superstar. <laughs> I'm I'm okay. A good, just a it's good one. How about Colin Miller? Does that fit your... Is that, that the name yes. on my lips. Yeah, the, okay. the, Colin, dude, Vegas doesn't play him. They're in cap bullshit somehow. They're over. They, they're already because well, no, they traded for Mark Stone and then they re-signed him to a big contract that and, he deserves. No, no, yeah. he obviously he deserves more than that. Um, he deserves. If Tavares is making what eleven million, Stone deserves yeah. eleven million in my opinion. I think Stone's incredible. But here's the thing: Vegas signed Mark Stone, but it didn't count until the next season. Nine and a half million kicks in. They're now over the cap, and they haven't even re-signed uh, William Carlson oh, yet. God. He's an RFA right now. They're so that's another, one. what, six, seven million for William Carlson. Yeah. They're going to be like eight million over the cap. So they need to shed some salary here. I like Colin Miller's Colin making, Miller, what, yeah. four, 4.2 million, 3.9 million? Yeah. It's something in that general area. I don't mm -hmm. know why I use those numbers. I've seen yeah. something like that before on Cap Friendly. But he's making roughly four million dollars. Could easily play on a second pairing, I think. I, I don't think that's too much of a stretch to say. First pairing's a bit much for him, I think, but you play him on a That's second fine. pairing with someone like Dermot, you play him on a second pairing. Oh, that'd be brilliant. M Muzzin, Muzzin and Miller, I feel like their games complement each other really well. Miller's that dynamic puck mover. Muzzin's steady defenseman. I'd love to see it. And then you go Riley Dermot as your other pairing. Hey, there's two good pairings. I would love to see right? it. Right? Make right? it happen. Uh, Here we Sue are. Greyhound has great metrics when it comes to the advanced stuff, the breakout metrics. The It's a gimme. Kyle it's, a, Dubas, it's a gimme of a match. I don't know yeah. if he's listening, but I can guarantee you that Kyle Dubas likes Colin Miller as a player yeah. and probably wants him, and he's yeah. available, and every team knows that Vegas has to trade him salary-wise. They tried to trade him at the deadline. He was healthy scratch the last couple days before the deadline. He was de definitely available. Um, he was healthy scratch, what, game one or game two of the playoffs? Yeah, it's I a think, very weird yeah. situation, so... I really like him. He might be, what, a number three, a number four? I don't, but he's good. He's probably a four. Well, they were probably asking it's too much to the top because four. He's been sheltered. He's been sheltered. We but, haven't seen him in a top four role for a long period of time. And and but now Vegas loses some leverage because at the trade deadline they weren't in cap hell and now they are. Exactly. So, so tough so, shit. Yeah. Give us Colin Miller. The hard it's part is what do you point. give up for him because they don't want to take any money back. I know we're gonna throw out Connor Brown is like, oh, every team's gonna want Connor Brown, but that's what two point no, one million. You trade him to Edmonton. It's... Colin Miller's three point eight seven five. They might the want way. cost controlled uh, young assets and picks. I don't know if like that's Bracco. where a Bracco makes some sense. It's. We're just about, trading Bracco everywhere, Brown Bracco. man. Bracco was a part of the Marlowe trade. Bracco was a part of the Zaitsev trade. Bracco was a part of the Colin Miller trade. What uh, what, what trade isn't Bracco a part of? Yeah. What well, what if it's Brown and Bracco and a second? Second and a second <laughs> <laughs> for Colin Miller. That's a bit this much. Week, but like, I don't think we're far off. This week, Chris Letang, uh, he did an article with Sean Gordon in the Athletic, and he had some comments about the Leafs. Oh, what? So he says. Oh, I saw this. The teams that win tend to be older teams. When we won those couple of years, we were an older team. The Capitals last year, old team. The two teams in the final this year, old teams. Younger players need to be shown the steps and how to take them. I'm not saying that because I'm an older guy now. I'm saying it because I lived it. I won a Stanley Cup at 22. I won at 28 and 29. It just seems to me that a lot of young guys aren't supported as well as they should be. You see what's happening in Toronto. It's a phenomenon that's going to happen to other teams. And he continued. Your younger players are supposed to provide your depth. Now you're starting to see your older guys on third and fourth lines. I think some teams are trying to get too young too quickly. Then your top center scored 80, 90 points, and he wants $10 million. <laughs> Mitch Marner. And now That's you're a screwed. Center. That's uh, money for a center. So. Our <laughs> top center is the best player in the world, Sidney Crosby, and he makes $8.7 million. People think it's a superstition. It's about the number, but it's also about having other great players beside him. It would be pretty dumb on his part to ask for $14 million and then play with guys who make $3 million. How old was Chris Letang when he won his first Stanley Cup? Uh, he 22. said he was 22. That's what I thought. Does Chris Letang realize that when Sidney Crosby signed that contract, it was worth like 15% of the cap? Yeah. Because... No. No, he doesn't. Which would be the <laughs> highest contract in the NHL today. Right, and also, okay, I get it, you have Sidney Crosby, but the best player in the world right now is still Connor McDavid, and his team didn't make the playoffs, and it wasn't because there was a bunch of old, or it wasn't because there were too many young guys. It's because they're paying McDavid too much money. It's because they're paying McDavid too much money. That's what I've been hearing in Edmonton. Yep. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't understand that, because <laughs> when Crosby signed his contract... It was worth a huge chunk of the cap. The fact that the his cap first has contract, at least. gone up 
exponentially yep. since obviously makes the value of the contract go down. By the time McDavid's deal's done, the cap's going to be at a hundred and some odd million dollars, like early hundred million. 10, 20 years from now, we're going to be looking at like, you know, 15, 20 million dollar contracts, you know. Right, and, that's and it's going to be the bargain of the league. So I don't think those comments are quite fair because when you look at some of the contracts and when, for me, it's all about when they were signed. What was the cap percentage the year that it kicked in? So the, the Nick, Bruins are a good example, right? The Bruins are a great example. Like, I just don't think that that's necessarily a fair comment. And we're also seeing like sports science. And anyone who wants to tell me that Chris Letang is smarter than a scientist, I mean, I don't really know what to tell you. Science tells you, and literally every age curve tells you that you get worse as a hockey player. After you hit, what, 28, 29? I was going to say 24, 25. It starts to steadily right? decrease, so and then it jumps off a cliff when you get closer to 30. Better players, whether the, you can't have... It's just the way the league is going with the speed and, and everything. You can't have the old guys on your top lines anymore. They're not quick enough. Well, unless they're, like, incredible elite players. Sidney sure. Crosby. Yeah, I would Steve, like what do you know, make of the comments? Well, I want to know what... Chris Letang's interpretation of old is because I look at the two teams in the final and okay Bergeron is obviously tail end of prime or whatever or Chara. He's, and, he calls himself an older guy so I think yeah and but, Chara who is yeah. in his 40s 40s right? he's 42 yeah. he's old but like <laughs> Tarasenko smack dab in the middle of prime Petrangelo Ryan O'Reilly, Ryan O'Reilly Pareko's young Pareko uh, Braden Shen Robert Jayden Thomas Schwartz, Robert Th- dude the whole team Marshan is right there in his prime. Tori Krug, I made an argument in my video today. If the Bruins win the cup, they should really consider him for Conn Smythe. It'll Pasternak. probably be Ras, but they... Pasternak. Pasternak hasn't been playing too well, though, has he, lately? Nah, okay, but you can't he's, argue he's that okay he's player. bad. Oh, no, he's really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie McAvoy. Yeah. Like, you talk about the guys I think driving his argument, the ship. His arg- mm-hmm. well, yeah, who's I, driving the bus? I understood yeah. his argument, but the vehicle. I, think, I think it's a bit flawed because, again, you look at that Pittsburgh team that won their first Stanley Cup. I mean, Crosby was young. Malcolm was young. Latang was young. It was Jordan Stahl Malcolm in that Crosby team. He was young. Yeah. Crosby was the youngest captain in the history of the league to win the cup, and yeah. then Taves won it. The next year, yeah, and he yeah. was also the same age. So get out of yeah, here. Just because you got Patrick Bill Kane is the really deadline the doesn't time. mean that old guys is the answer. You have to look in the cap era, I think, because before the cap era, these arguments don't really count no. as much because no. you could spend whatever you wanted on players and it yes. didn't really matter. But first yeah. team to win in the cup era is funny. We were talking about this. Or the cap era is uh, the Carolina Hurricanes won a cup. Um, Eric Stahl, I'm not sure if he was on his ELC. Um, yeah. Cam Ward on a cheap contract. Next team was Anaheim. And it's funny because even though it wasn't their best player, who were making a lot of money, Corey Perry and Ryan Getzlaff were on the second line, but on entry-level contracts, mm. really matters, really matters. That gave them flexibility to spend more money on Niedermeyer, on, was Pronger on that team? Yeah. yeah. See, I couldn't see because he's behind the screen, but he's got his yeah. phone now. <laughs> I, need, I need some info. I'm like, yeah. come on, I can't do this without like, yeah, metrics I, and everything. I don't think those comments are, are all that fair. Do you doubt he wasn't the, the very Penguins. old on the LA King team that won? The, the, the back-to-back Penguins teams were Crosby, Malkin, it was like the big five of guys making money. They had a rookie in net, and then yeah. a sophomore in net, uh, and they were carried by a bunch of cheap young guys. Brian Gensel, Rust. Brian Russ, Connor Sherry. Yeah. And it's funny, they really struggled when they didn't have those guys. They really struggled when they were trading for the older, like, Bill Guerins of the world. That's when they weren't making it very far. They, they lost needed... their mind and got Ryan Reeves for no good reason. No, let's, when they lost their whatever. minds and traded two second-round picks for who was that fighter, that, that guy, who, the defenseman who was not very... Douglas Murray. Oh, dear God. They traded two second-round picks oh, for Douglas right. Murray, who was, like, the worst, like, on-ice shot metrics player of that era. He was he got caved in every time he was on the ice. Played big minutes in the playoffs and was bad. He's, like, yep. worse than Roman Polak. Think of a much worse version of Roman Polak. Speaking of Roman Polak. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you think his comments were more about giving the young guys the big contracts? Because at the time, like, when Taves and Kane win, they are still on their ELCs and all that. It wasn't until I think it's afterwards, pu- the 10-point. I think it's a pushback. It's a pushback. <laughs> it's pushed back to the player empowerment era, which we're yeah. starting to see. In the NBA, it's really taken off where players realize that they have the most power. In the NHL, we're starting to realize it. You know, mm. guys like Eichel, guys like Matthews are really, like, kicking their heels in in these contract negotiations and getting paid more than former stars were. I think it's smart. I think it's a market correction. I think these star players are worth that money and then some. McDavid should have negotiated for a max contract. I'm still upset that he didn't. That was ridiculous. But... 
Here's the thing. We're living in an well, era the now. The are good now because he took the discount. Right? So. Oh, God. Yeah, he took the discount so that they could get more players and then they went so out they could and spend did more money on Milan and was. Chris Russell. That's that why I took the guy. discount. Yeah. I think guy. Ken Holland's done a good job since coming yeah, but, in, though. But, I really do. They went out and got Lucic. Oh, yeah, me too. They went out and got Lucic because Connor McDavid said he wanted to play with him when he was 15. Man, I thought dumb shit when I was 15, too. Like, he's, he's a grown man now. Didn't McDavid say he, he really liked Tyler Bozak or something like yeah, that as a player yeah, growing Because yeah. he was a Leaf fan. <laughs> oh, like, come on, man. But yeah, no, I can hear what you're saying is that he doesn't like the idea that um, a player makes over $10 million. That's really going to make it difficult to, know, to navigate the cap. And he's not wrong. It does make it more difficult, but I think it leads to you needing to spend less on your secondary veterans and have secondary young players. When you have a young Jake Gensel, when you have a young Connor Sheary on an entry-level contract, you can win a cup. When those mm-hmm. players are making four, five, six, seven million dollars, all of a sudden Pittsburgh isn't in the cup final anymore because that's what you need. You need young, cheap depth. Look at the Blackhawks when they won their Stanley Cups. It's when they had Brendan Saad on an ELC. You need uh, Mark andre Fleury yeah. to not be ass against the Flyers. Yeah. And then uh, at the uh, LA, they had Tanner Pearson on an ELC. Tyler Toffoli on a really cheap deal. Mm-hmm. So I think what it's come to now is obviously you need the superstar players. That's always been the case. You need the elite, elite talent. And they're always going to make a high percentage of the cap. That's always been the case. But you need the secondary cheap players, and those tend to be young players in mm-hmm. my opinion. So... Whether or not your elite players are 22 or 28, as long as they're not falling off of a cliff and, like, you know, 39, 40, like, Chara, Chara isn't Chara anymore. You know what I mean? Chara no. isn't. Okay, so question. Was five, six Let's say ago. Sidney Crosby is 23. Okay. On, and he's a free agent, or, like, he's going into his RFA year this summer. What is What does his salary start at next year? 14. At, Wait, at least, right? Twenty-three-year-old Sidney Crosby. Crosby in today's game. What's the max contract? It should be that. I, I just yeah. like why, That's what I'm why saying. are players making the max so in the NHL? 50, they are in the like NBA. It's, it's Ma- not fair to There's be a lot of max contract players in the NBA six years ago. Mm-hmm. I don't understand why why the star players don't make more in the NHL. I always feel like they they deserve it. And then I never understood why second liners or complimentary third liners make four or five million because they're not worth that. And it's funny. I. I it's tried the death zone. I tried so hard to like the contracts that kill you. I tried so hard to make a make a chart when it came to. Of course, I tried to make a chart when it came to fair market value on contracts, what players actually worth in terms of on ice value, and what they're earning. And I thought it would be a straight line, but it's a bit more exponential because at the high end, yeah. those players are providing a ton of value and are therefore worth a ton of money. The players in the middle, you'd think, oh, you know, they're worth. Five million, six. They're really not. They're worth like two or three million. They're all the maybes. Yeah. yeah. The Zach Hyman's of the world aren't worth five, six million. You know, when he's due for his next contract, he's going to be a UFA. Mm-hmm. He's going to have accumulated a lot of big seasons and he's going to be wanting four or five million. The cap's going to go up. Maybe he wants six million. The Leafs can't nope. afford to play players like that, that kind of money. You need to get them on cheaper contracts. And that's what it comes down to. In the NHL, don't pay your complimentary players a lot of money. Pay your stars. And then get lots of cheap young depth. If you can get cheap old depth, that's fine. But older players tend to cost more. Younger players tend to be cheaper. So that's why, even though I think you need a veteran or two when it comes to the off-ice stuff, it's incredibly difficult to quantify. I think you need cheaper, good players to fill out your roster. Those tend to be the younger players, in my opinion. But hey, if you can get a nice, cheap... I'm trying to think of a cheaper, older player who took a bit of a discount. Like Brian Campbell when he went to Chicago. Mm -hmm. Justin Williams on the Carolina Hurricanes right now. Like, that's a good player you want in your team. You like that contract. But when you have to pay $6.25 million for Patrick Marleau for three years, I'm not sure if that's an ideal contract in the modern landscape. You know know what you should do rather than um, scout really well and find uh, young, cheap talent is you should double Roman Polak's salary. (laughs) Good God. This is what you should do. You know what you should do uh, is double Roman Bull X. This might Always. be a an easy answer. Mm. The next question is, do you see the Leafs picking in the first round this upcoming draft? No. No. No? Rachel? No. No? What's with the smile? Steve? Oh, you, yeah. Yeah. I, What's yes. the question? I say yes. <laughs> I want more from Rachel here. That was a weird well, reaction. Okay, so yeah. is, is, is there a world where the Leafs trade for a first of round course. pick in the next within the next couple of weeks? Kyle, do Can I, I mean, quantify? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, answer this question first. Is Mitch Marner's contract signed before the draft? (laughs) (laughs) We'll do that next. (laughs) Because. I think so. Because if Mitch Marner isn't signed before the draft, I do believe they pick in the first round, and I believe he is the subject of that. Do you think he's traded to the New Jersey Devils for the first overall pick? (laughs) Absolutely not. (laughs) Um, No. Just throwing that out This went to a place I did not anticipate. (laughs) On October 4th, when the NHL season begins, 
Is that when? That's when this upcoming NHL season begins. Yes. Who is Mitch Marner playing for? Toronto Maple Leafs. What does this contract look like? And what do Leafs fans think of Mitch Marner? Toronto Maple Leafs, three million times eight years. There's <laughs> your answer. What if it's the inverse? Yeah, what, what if it's eight, 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 eight million three, three years? Bit of I, a bridge would, deal. I wouldn't I'd, really have an issue with that. that. Would be a shocker. Eight point five million for three years. Listen, that creates a world of hurt for you in three years, but right. for those three years, it's pretty so, good. Um, I don't think it is relative to the market. I think no. you look at what Panarin got on his bridge deal. You look at what Kucherov got on his bridge deal. Those are the most comparable like players who took bridge deals. And Kucherov, Kucherov, three years at four point eight million. Panarin, two years at six million. I mean, oh, the bridge deal's dead. Well, no, for, but for, for star stars? players, it just it just doesn't exist. There's it's so yeah. rare. It's so tough trying to find it. So that's why I don't think a bridge is going to happen just because it's. Marner's going to want like nine million on a three-year deal. The, the Leafs are going to want him at seven million, and they're not going to find any middle ground. When it comes to a long-term deal, I think a six or seven-year deal under ten million, but maybe north of what fans want. Maybe nine point six, nine point seven, nine point eight. I wouldn't be shocked if it's in that range. But if you look at comparables, the Patrick Kane coming off of his ELC is the best comparable. Yeah. But it was from like nine years ago, so it's tough trying to make a comparable. Leon Drysaddle is an interesting one. Played a bit of center. But mostly wing and the such a weird it's a it's a weird contract, position. but it's interesting. That would be about nine point one or nine point two million if Marner took the same one. I know he's negotiating for north of eleven because of an offer sheet, but realistically, I don't think we see an offer sheet. I nope. think it comes in somewhere under the, the he can sign an offer sheet for the under ten point five million dollar and and really force the lease in that scenario. So he could maybe negotiate for north of ten million. I still think it comes in in the high nines, but Rachel's making a face right now, so I'll let her talk. <laughs> Is Mitch Marner a Leaf next year, Rachel? Well, here it comes. Yes. No. You don't think he is? I don't think he is. <laughs> wow. No. Well, you it depends. Yeah. Who makes the choice, Mitch or his father? Because uh, I think if it's his father's choice, he's not a Leaf because it's, it's about the money. But I think Mitch actually is one of the... He's very Tavares-like in the fact that he wants to be a Leaf. He likes being a Leaf. And at the end of the day, it's Mitch's choice. He could tell his agent, I am taking 9-1. And his agent can't say anything because then Mitch can turn around and go, okay, you're fired. That's what Goudreau did late in his contract situation with the exact same agent, if I'm not mistaken. With Ferris. Yeah. He, Ferris is known for it, and he's, interestingly enough, Taylor Hall's agent. So mm. it'll be. And Taylor Hall this week said... I can't remember the exact. He basically, quote, but was, basically <laughs> yeah, he oh, basically it. said like you've earned the right to be a UFA. Like, basically, like hinting that he's going to hit the open market and test the waters. But essentially, so I think Marner's deal, if he stays with the Leafs, like if he is a Leaf, I think it's nine five or south. Um, I don't think he's worth more than that. Um, I just even on an with, eight year deal because then no, the ter- then no, the money goes up a little bit. I think bit. it's I think it's likely. What is Matt? What was Matthews' deal? Five. Matthews did five. Nylander did six. But Nylander and Matthews are going to d- end at the exact same right, time. Right. So I think Marner's is either yes. a six-year deal. You can't have all three guys ending at the same. Yeah, time. Marner, you can't go five. It needs to be six. It has to be six or, or four. Yeah. yeah, you can't have them all. So ending can't at go four. At the same no, time. Four That'd walks be awful. into UFA. Four walks. Into oh UFA. right, no, no, no. So it's got to be six. It yeah. has to be six. Six, seven, eight, or three. I think. <laughs> I think if it's north of ten, like if his axe is let's say he goes, I'm gonna sign an offer sheet for ten point four so you wouldn't get the four first round picks, I think Kyle goes the heartless route and trades him. Oh I really Ooh. I really think he does. So if someone signs him to an offer sheet, I know you have seven days to first match, of all but he has you... to sign the offer sheet. He has to want to go to whoever offers him. So That's what people know, are I feeling so? about that I one. I feel like you have to match it at that point. If he if it's less than ten point five, basically no, no, I'm not letting him short. get there is what I'm saying. For I'm listeners trading him. who are confused right now, so north of ten point five million, if you sign an offer sheet for north of ten point five million, you get four first round picks from that team for the next four unprotected. years. Unprotected. Unprotected. If they unprotected. win the lottery, you get it. If they get a top three pick, three drafts from now, it's your pick. This could be very valuable because if you look at what happened to the Brooklyn Nets like ten years ago when they traded for Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, is that just those two players or did they get anyone else? I they didn't get Ray Allen because Ray Allen went yeah. somewhere else. In that trade, they traded like for first round picks from like years in the future, and it ended up coming to bite them in the ass because those ended up being top three picks. So they, they can be very valuable. But here's the thing: if it's under ten point five million, let's say ten point four million, ten point three million, ten on the dot, then the compensation is two firsts, a second, and a third. 
to me, I'm not happy eating that to get rid of Mitch Marner. That's not good enough return for me. I like the four first round picks because I like the idea that one of those could be a very nice pick. But with two firsts, a second and a third, I'm not feeling that. You're saying, your argument is that, no, it's not that you're not going to match going it. It's the fact that you get to that point for trade of- 11, I don't think. I, if he's actually going to sign an offer that. sheet, I don't think it's going to be less than 11. A lot of people are saying, oh, he's going to have offer sheets. No one's mentioning that he actually has to want to play in whoever offer sheets. I'm mm-hmm. like, if Quick it, question. Who's offer sheeting? Braden Point, Miko Rantanen, and Sebastian Ajo. I just, thank you. Well, Patrick Laine, to me, is an excellent candidate because... Jack Roslevic. It, well, and okay... So that's the mid- okay, Jack Roslovich. Jack, Jack Roslovich is in that middle good. tier with Kapanen and Janssen, Yeah. But. There's okay. You know what there isn't with Mitch Marner and Miko Ranton and, and Braden Point. The debate as to whether or not they're even good. You know. So like Patrick Line to me is this fascinating, fascinating player. Back to back forty goal years, and then what the I, hell was that? I, <laughs> I think he gets like a two year deal. I think he gets like a two year deal at like four million bucks. He'd love to sign right. a one year, I bet you. <laughs> but and heading then, yeah. into the season, do you think he was picturing a two year deal? Absolutely not. Hell no. So if someone nine if, years, ten million. I think go. it would be smart to or lock years, him up because mil. I think he bounces back. I think you're right. So but, but he what if the Jets dig in on the two year thing? And some team I just think, goes, you I know what, it, Leroy Jenkins, and they go in. I and think give it's gonna be seven. a Subban situation where you should lock him up now because I think he's gonna explode, and this is when his value is gonna be at an all-time low. So, and you're the Jets, you have such a hard time. Remember keeping when Kadri guys? came off of a career low in shooting percentage, and the Leafs signed him to a long-term contract? How'd that look awesome. a year or two later? Yeah, awesome. So, yeah. Speaking Amazing. of which, he's apparently being traded to every team in the league right now. Everyone but, yeah. did. Nazem Kadri's cross check to Jake DeBrus cost him his career with the Leafs. No, nope. according to Sean Avery. <sighs> yeah, don't. Listen to him. Yeah, let's maybe stop with him, guys. Let's yeah. maybe with let's not give him any more. The attention. Sean Avery. Um, Steve, what do so, you think? Okay, I've I have two answers for you. Okay. Wait, oh, is this the Kadri thing or yes? We go going... ahead, Kadri. Oh, because I have I have answers for the first round thing. But... Oh, okay. Um, yeah, let, no, we can go back. Okay. Yeah. So I I have a I have a happy answer and a dark answer. Oh, so for okay. Mitch Marner okay. traded versus picks versus offer sheets. Yay, fun time. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Kyle Dubas uh, alluded when he was in Buffalo at the draft combine that nobody cared about, or as I call it, the jumpy pull-up contest. We did a, we the, did a the podcast about contest. the combine where I said it was the dumbest thing ever compared to like the NFL. It's, it's so, yeah, so frustrating. Um, if there's a snake outside right now, which one of us is walking outside? Uh, me, I used to work at the zoo. <laughs> no, you, you're wearing pants. I got shorts on. I'm susceptible. Mm-hmm. What are so, some other dumb combine questions? Oh my god! Here, here, get your okay. absolutely so for, zero comment. Yeah, for a first round pick, um, I think Dubas is interested, and I think he's looking. And honestly, it might even be a really good scenario for the Leafs because they're sort of in this cap crunch. Who doesn't like first round picks? If you could trade someone on your roster for a first round pick and then replace them with someone you have in the Marlies, I think that's a you're pretty saying good like a win. Kapanen or a Janssen, yes. not not a Marner, obviously. Well. well Marner needs Which, to be much bigger than that. Yeah. Right. So that brings me to the dark answer. Um, Mitch Marner, really good player, uh, fan favorite. Uh, every, everyone listening in the car with your kids, here's your warning: three, two, one. Uh, really good player, popular in the city. Fuck it. Don't yeah. care. Look at the Raptors right now. Look at the, you know what I I I was having a such a miserable off season like since the Leafs got eliminated. And watching the Raptors, watching the, I'm, I, I'll go back to it again. Nothing changed my mind about hockey more than the opening tease for Game One of the NBA Final with Socrates that that Sportsnet did. Oh my god! Do you it think was a... it was easy to let go of these men? Did this and that, and it was a callback. To, they're basically saying called it because it was a callback to their video they did Game One of the regular season with the whole Demar trade. It, and dude, it hurt. Popular Everyone loved guy. him. He was the nicest dude yeah. ever. He's, like you, a yeah. popular guy. Lots of people own his jersey. Gives a shit. <laughs> he wants to be here or he doesn't. Yep. If you don't have an answer by a certain date, fuck it. You're gone. Like, I because okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not loyal to any place. You know what? I'll like the next guy. <laughs> there's a well, oh, there's no one else in the Leafs to like. I like the next guy. If the trade makes sense for the organization, fuck it. Counter argument. Why wasn't this the case with Austin Matthews, who signed what I think all of us would agree is an above market contract? Because I hadn't snapped yet. <laughs> I have. So I have Austin snapped. Matthews remained unsigned, and we were having these same ta- conversations right now. Fuck it. And it said that Matthews wanted a five by eleven six. We're going f that trade. Yeah. 
Why isn't that the same mentality you're going with with Marner? I hadn't snapped yet, and at the time, I was doing all this waxing poetically. Mm -hmm. Austin Matthews means uh, something. He was the changing of the guard, and oh my god, the team before and after There's him. There's always a next guy. Yeah, Can I and ask now... you something? Yeah, sure. If Lou Lamorello is the GM of the Leafs this year, mm -hmm. does is any of this Marner crap happening? Like, is Darren Ferris on the radio? Is Paul Marner speaking? Like... Is it the circus that it is if Lou's the GM? I think it's a, I think it's a shot at Kyle. Uh, I think you're right. Right? Because <laughs> there's no way that Lou allows that. First of all, uh, well, no. Darren <laughs> Ferris would have the world's fanciest pair of cement shoes. Um, <laughs> at the bottom like, of the I lake. Think, yes. I think, <laughs> that was, I I think mean, this I is a shot at Kyle. Kyle. Did. But, sorry? I, uh, I mean, yes, because I, I think it's being put out there that he's an excellent talent evaluator. Um, but it's a little bit more than identifying who's good and who isn't, right? It's negotiating these deals. And sometimes maybe you got to be a 76 year old who doesn't give a shit, uh, versus a, uh, however old Kyle is 33 or 34. Right. Like, I think it would send a lost message. lost his first two major deals? No, Nylander I don't understand why people Matthews? keep saying no. that. Okay, okay, I don't think the Nylander deal is anywhere near as bad as people think it is. I think no. it's good. But the fact that it <laughs> well, went into December. Well, he had a terrible December. season, and that's the... that's the Shocking when you miss training camp. Also, maybe mm. this is going to make me a, a, a hyper nerd here, but did anyone remember when Nylander played with Austin Matthews, how well that line did together? Yes. And then when those two were separated, all of a sudden, neither player was the same anymore when it, at 5-on-5. Five five. Mm -hmm. Nylander's incredible at 5-on-5 five five at elevating Matthews' game. That's what he does. He gets the puck into the offensive yeah. zone, and you... Ah, oh, it's going to be another conversation. Here, here are the pros. The pros of keeping Nylander off of Matthews' line in the playoffs. Andreas Janssen and Kasperi Kapanen spent money. Uh, here are the cons. They're fucking watching. <laughs> that Those are the cons, are, are, is that they're are, watching. Are Kapanen's firing a long-distance shot from the top of the circle when he should be <laughs> saucer passing it to a wide-open Austin Matthews? Skin I love, skin skin I love Kapanen. Love, love, love him, but I, I don't like him with Austin Matthews for that very reason. I think oh. I, I'm, I wouldn't mind yeah. Kapanen on the left wing with Matthews and Nylander. I really like that. He's, he's going to get an audition, I think, in the Hyman role, uh, would, potentially, to start to the season. Hyman, uh, Kapanen. Because it depends on if he signs with the Leafs or depends not. Depends on if he signs with the Leafs or not, of course. Because if you're coming and asking for four and a half million dollars, I'm like, yeah. yeah, I don't think so. This is the annoying thing about talking about next year's team. I'm just you have no for the idea sake what of conversation. Like. Yeah, this could be last year's Raptors podcast where we're talking about Demar Derozan and the offense, and all of a sudden it changes. You know, yeah, so. and it, it's it's just it's we spent all summer at least. So I don't know if you've heard the story or yet or whatever, but Adam and I were on the radio hosting a show for the first time. I remember this. The yeah. day after. And you had, three hour block? you had a three-hour block? You had a three-hour block? One to four, block. right? You were doing good show for uh, JD and, and we, No, Venice, we were doing right? Jeff Blair. Oh, okay. And yeah, shitting yeah. ourselves. Oh, okay. we're, we're just dying. And it was, the the whole conversation was, oh, but Damar. And, man, fuck Damar. Like, <laughs> dude, I don't care. A great guy. Great for the city. I hope he comes to the game. I hope they retire his jersey. I don't give a shit. Kawhi Leonard's got them within two wins of a championship at the time we're doing this podcast. Whether they win or lose, it was absolutely 100,000% the right move to do. So if someone... For, forget the wants to be here, doesn't want to be here. If it's the best move for the team, pull the trigger and do it. That's why I think like if they... let's You get to the draft, and if you say, okay, this is our best offer to Marner, mm -hmm. and if they say no... I think you trade him, and that's the piece you use to get your number one defenseman because bet your bottom dollar that you will get one. <sighs> I still don't... I, this team's much better off with Mitch Marner than without him. I agree. I, I think I need to be oh, the... Oh, absolutely. Like, like, but if he's going to be like, I want $11 million or I'm signing an offer sheet, all right, then see you later because I'm not paying you $11 million. Are the What are you okay the... paying him? What's the absolute maximum mm -hmm. that you would live with paying Mitch Marner? 975 So he's 9 eight, He's gone for, in your books? Like yeah. I feel like you live with 9 eight. I feel like you would. Okay, yeah. under 10. Okay, all right. If it's a double-digit contract, I'm you hit the brakes. Which goes just, back to my theory of nine ninety nine. Okay, is, I just <laughs> Is Nazem Kadri a Toronto Maple Leaf next year? Yes. Rachel? Mm. Yes. I don't see how you come out of a Nazem Kadri trade with a better team that has a better chance of winning a cup. Agreed. Because I feel like what Nazem Kadri allows you to do is play Matthews and Nylander together, Tavares and Marner together, and then have a third line that regardless of who you play with Kadri is going to outperform the competition at 5-on-5. Five five. Yep. 
are you going to have you trade Nazem Kadri all of a sudden you have good defense okay maybe mm-hmm. you get Jacob Truba according to Sean Avery maybe you get Brett Pesci maybe you get oh my god that would be a great you have good defense my with point Nazem Kadri is, in your lineup that would by make sense for both the sides a Kadri to for answer Pesci would make sense to Jesse's question but, I do believe he is a Leaf next year and this is why I, I believe, believe there's a stern conversation being had if it hasn't already it has yeah it, it 100% has but I believe he's a Leaf next year unless Kyle gets an offer, this is talk about being cold-hearted, that he can't refuse. If you have an opportunity to make your team better, you have an obligation to do it, no matter who it is. If the Leafs get an offer for Austin Matthews because it's for Connor McDavid, <laughs> Dubas has an obligation to make that trade. Mm-hmm. That would never happen, mm-hmm. but what I'm saying is if you have an opportunity mm-hmm. to make your team better, you have an obligation to do it. I think Kadri is becoming very undervalued now by Leafs fans because of frustration. I understand it. That's your, that's your Guilty. goal as a fan, is Guilty. to get very frustrated with the player. Believe yeah. me, I'm very, very frustrated with Kadri. I was there was some expletives in that game too, right after he did what he oh. did, because I thought he'd just cost them the series. I didn't think the Leafs were gonna make it to game seven without him, and they did, but still extremely frustrating. They, uh, but mm. here's the thing. Here's what Nazem Kadri is. He is a, a, a play driving, he's a line. He, he, he look at the wingers he's played with throughout his career. Uh, he, when he was playing with Michael Grabner, Leaf Legend, when he was playing with <laughs> Daniel Winnick, when he was God, playing oh my with God. And, he, and those lines were always facing tough competition and coming out on top. Uh, you look at the line with my favorite example of him was the first year where the Leafs were actually good, where uh, hashtag actually yeah, good, in yeah, fact, yeah, yeah. where he was on a line with Komarov and Connor Brown for most of the season. Uh-huh. Hard match to tough competition. He's that, your lockdown okay, center. Like, how, book it. Why would you trade that? Average you NHL center. What does an average NHL center do with Komarov, Connor Brown, tough competition, D zone starts? What, what percent of shots and goals and scoring chances? 45% you might expect? He was north of 50%. He was like 51 or 52%. That shouldn't happen, but it did because of how good he is at 5-on-5. Five five. And because, like, you know, oh, 4.5 for your third line center, first of all, try to find a UFA center for that, that's any good for less than that. Second of all, he allows you to have cheaper wingers. And also, you don't need a fourth line center when you have Matthews, Tavares, and Kadri. That's right. my this thing. Yeah. For yeah. like all year. You should be running seven defensemen out there. Yeah. Exactly. During Why the do you even season, have a fourth line center? During the regular season, fine. But like, sure. look Whatever. at the playoffs in the NBA. You shorten the rotations, and all yeah. of a sudden, yes. you don't go with nine, ten, eleven, twelve men on the bench. You run your eight yeah. best players yes. a lot of minutes. Kawhi Leonard played what thirty minutes, thirty-one minutes per game in the regular season. He's going north of forty in most playoff games because you need him. In it's the playoffs, the playoffs, in the no playoffs tomorrow. Leafs should be running. Matthews, 21 minutes. Tavares, 21 minutes. Kadri, 18 minutes. How many does that leave for Gautier? Zero. Zero. He doesn't dress. <laughs> like, it's just... it's. Uh, speaking of minutes, is Mike Babcock the head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs in the 2020 season? No. So 2020-2021? 2020-2021. So um, that is not this upcoming season, but the one after. Who's I'm, the head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs? Mike I, Babcock or not Mike I'm Babcock? going to say no. Is that a big shocker? Please yell. At, at him? Yeah. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> well, because well, I'm not sure he's Wait, wrong. Can you do your yelling again? Ah. <laughs> Wouldn't shock me if Sheldon Keefe was the Leafs head coach that year instead of Mike Babcock. Okay, the Leafs make the conference final next year. <laughs> is that what you think they're going to do? I'm saying, Babcock is he buys automatically himself five years. fired? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is he automatically fired? No, I'm not saying automatically. This is not automatic. This is a guess. Yeah, I have to yeah, forecast this is, yeah. what right. happens in the regular okay, season. Okay, does this make the conference final? Is Babcock on the bench the year after? Probably, because he probably did things that resulted in them having good mm-hmm. on-ice performance. But you don't but, see him doing those things. And that's well, that the thing. mural. We the plurs. Yeah. Like, so, we the plurs. We the plurs. The apostrophe. So, here's the thing. I hope he is. Because yeah. then it would mean that he likely changed some parts of his game. He was more willing to activate defensemen on the breakout and... Play someone like Travis Durham at more minutes. Give him more, a better role. Play Matthews and Nylander together every single goddamn shift at 5-on-5. Five five. Um, play the top unit power play more than 50% of the minute. I think 57% was it what Austin Matthews It should literally be 75 and yeah. no less. Matthews played 57% of the, the uh, power play minutes for the Leafs this year at 5-on-4. And that should not be the case. Nor should it be for Marner, nor should it be for Tavares. You have those players, use them. Uh, basically, all these things that we get frustrated with, um, if Ron Hainsey is in the top four, if uh, Patrick Marlowe is in the top six, I'm not sure if Patrick Marlowe is going to be on the team, but you, you know what I mean. Uh, I don't think either of those players are going to be on the Steve, team. Steve, so do you want to yell at if, him if, or no? If, no? if there are these no? constant things that we've been seeing for the last few years that have been holding the team back, and here's the thing, yeah. Babcock has done a lot of great, especially in his first year with the team. Look at how many rookies he played. Put Matthews in a position to succeed. Put Nylander in a position to succeed. Yeah, why did that stop? That's uh, kind of like I think he I think he'll be back as coach next uh like the season after. Mm-hmm. If not unless 
obviously, like, the Leafs miss the playoffs or they go out in five in the first round type thing. Even if they go out, like, in the second round and it's because of things that are easily coachable. Exactly. I think it'll, it, it will come down, first of all, I think that the fact that Kyle's taken his assistant coaching toys away is big. I mm. think that's huge because Jim Hiller's been with him since Detroit. So and, uh, Can I just say that? I don't think Jim Hiller did a terrible job. I don't think he did either. I think he gave DJ Smith a lot of rope. Um, I thought DJ Smith should have been fired before this season. Agreed. Um, and now he's the coach of the Ottawa Senators, which, I mean, you don't know I wish him the best of luck, and I hope yeah. it goes well. Like, I, just I didn't think, think there's he'd... a difference between being an assistant coach and being a head coach. Exactly. I think right. Mike, exactly. Well, there's a potential that Mike is forced to change the way he thinks because of the new assistant coaches. Paul McParlin, 33 years old, he's going to run the power Innovative play thinker wants to Innovative try new thinker. things creatively. I don't know who they're going to bring in on the back end to coach like the D. I thought that Keefe would be very good for that. I'm curious to see. I don't think they see, want that dynamic, and it sounds like that yeah. isn't what I they I think want. that if Mike is shows that he's willing to improve and, and adjust... I think he's back no matter what. I think this is not about the on-ice product. This is about what are you doing as a coach, as if I'm Kyle Dubas, that I've asked you to do. So I have asked you to make adjustments X, Y, Z, because that's in line with what we want to be as an organization. If you do that and we still aren't successful because Matthews or Tavares or someone, you have a catastrophic injury that you can't really do anything about, as long as he makes the adjustments and he's running guys out and he's doing what Kyle's asked him, I think he stays on. If he does this hard-headed stuff where he's not playing, no matter if they make the second round or not, I think he's gone. And if the breakouts are predictable and we see, we see the yeah, same problems I think it all having. has to do yep. with what he does as a coach versus what the team does on the Steve, what do, you, what do you think? Uh, my answer is very Kevin Papetti. Show me the results. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, like you said, fire him if he keeps doing the same shit. Uh, if they improve like they ought to, keep him. Because and you think yeah. this is the year to do it? You don't give them one more? This Dude, is four this is first it? round Just... exits. But There's here's a the lot thing. of first round exits. And yeah. people talk about his first round exits going back to Detroit. I, I wiped that slate clean. Those teams weren't even supposed to be good, so yeah. whatever. Also, yeah, they other had than, Nick Lidstrom. Uh, yeah, and then <laughs> arguably the Leafs' first year, did we expect them to beat the Capitals? No. Last year against the Bruins, they had a shot. They lost. should have won this, this year, year. They had a chance well, against Bruins. This year, they had, they had, I think, other than St. Louis, the best shot that anyone's had against the Bruins in the playoffs. <laughs> so, I mean, you I get know. you people, you nuts. tweet that out, and you're gonna get uh, a lot of quote tweets about. So that, here's but. a scenario: <laughs> if you're if you tweet that out, most people would be like, "Yeah, good point." I think no. if you're Scott Wheeler, they go, "Fuck you." Well, Dom did it. Dom, <laughs> did it. Dom, Dom did it. got a lot of like heat for it. Seventy oh, percent the Bruins to win. The Leafs were at least like 50 50. But mm-hmm. here's a question for you. Let's say the Leafs go out in seven in the first round next year. But <sighs> the caveat is Matthews plays, it, as an average in the series, Matthews plays 22 minutes, Tavares plays 23 and, minutes. And in game and seven, Matthews su- played like 26 minutes. And- yeah, <laughs> and, and they're the subject of a Tyler Bozak tripping penalty in game seven. Or, like a, Do you a, or fire you get Babcock? halacked. You get halacked in the first round. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you fire Babcock if he's clearly shown, like, I'm running you guys out so, there the last 10 minutes of game seven? Was, it's only Matthews Tavares. I was going to make the same argument because you said show me the results. And it's like, as much as results matter in the playoffs, it's funny. I need to focus way more on the results. I was frustrated when the Raptors show won the game process. three. <laughs> because oh. I thought that they weren't playing well, and I thought that if Clay Thompson was in that game, they would have lost. But here's the thing: well, they results matter. Results absolutely matter. But yeah. as a coach, I care, care way more about the process because that's what yeah. you can yeah. control. You can control whether or not your team's breaking up the puck well. You can control the minute allocation, whether or not it's going right. In a playoff game, are you getting the most out of your players? And are you playing Nathan McKinnon 25 minutes a night? Colorado Avalanche in elimination games, absolutely they were. They right. lost, but are Colorado fans mad at their head coach? No, he basically did everything he could, and they didn't have the talent, but they made it much farther than they probably should have. I'd be very happy if I'm a Colorado fan. Leafs fans, after Game 7, are they happy? Are they happy that they did every single thing they possibly could have to advance? They're not feeling that way. So I think yeah. that's where the frustration comes down to. It's not necessarily just the result, because both teams lost. Even though Colorado made it around, both teams did get eliminated. But Colorado fans, after that game that they lost, they're feeling like their process was solid and it's going to lead to some sex- success in the future. Leafs fans are worried that that same process, re- when repeated, is going to lead to a bad result. So that's yeah. why I, the hashtag trust the process is a thing, because at the end of the day, it's what you can control. Sometimes shit happens yeah. and you and can't control the Watching result. the Raptors. <laughs> Danny Green. Yeah. Sometimes shit happens and like the shots don't drop. Sometimes saying, shit though, happens. Like, as, a, and, like, as, a, as the guy who yells about the Leafs. Yeah. To, to answer your question, Rachel, I fire him knowing it's unfair. 
Mm. So like you okay. just feel like you can't deal with another first round loss regardless. Right. Interesting. Do you feel like you do that to help protect your job because it's one of the mo- like the that is one of the reasons they yes. talk like that. It's a bullet in the chamber. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the bullet in the chamber, and people are talking about with Dubis. Oh, this isn't the year to do it. Maybe next year, if you get eliminated in the first round, that's the year to do it. I I know the percentages thing and the trust the process thing, but at some point, I I don't give a shit when. <laughs> oh, but it's the Bruins again. Do you watch the playoffs oh, well, this year? Job. Like, oh well, this and that and that. I I pay you to make championships, not excuses. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. It's if you funny. get halacked, if you do this, if you do that, Bruce Boudreaux got fired. I was about to bring him up. What happened the season or two after that? Uh, <laughs> wait, who? No, the Caps? No, when Bruce Boudreaux got fired? Oh, no, no. No, no. they brought in oh, Mark Dale Hunter. Hunter. D- Dale, Dale Hunter. Hunter. Sorry, they brought in Dale Hunter. Yeah. And it, it was, was a disaster. Yeah. Ovechkin had like... Oh, f- like the, the caveat I'll put on that is if you fire Mike Babcock, don't bring in a coach who's barely interested in being an NHL coach. <laughs> yeah, like, he was. Like, right? Like, do it, uh, Ovechkin, I could take it or leave it. Like, what? What are you talking about? If you fire Mike Babcock, you better be bringing in a very good candidate. Don't fire him if, if you have no idea of what you're doing, but I, I have a hard time believing that'll be the case. Steve. Kyle Dubas is a very uh, process-oriented human being. Yeah, is he? he? I've never seen him wear a trust the process shirt. I've never. <laughs> well, <laughs> he then would he, never just fire himself, someone. Yeah, he might set himself up to be the first GM to be fired before a coach. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but Brendan Shanahan is is also very process oriented. He's also a former pro athlete who probably hates watching. Yeah. Right. And then there's also the whole thing of they've got Larry Tannenbaum who's looking with dollar signs in his eyes because of how much the Raptors are making right, right yeah. now. Like at some him. point, imagine how like, much Leafs merch there'd be right now. Or if Leafs, both like, teams yeah. were good. And let's say the <laughs> Leafs were in the conference final and the Raptors are in the NBA final. MLSE would be just every night swimming at, at in a pond Celebration of Square money. at Dundas yeah. Square would be unreal. Jurassic Park would be a, like for both Leafs and oh, it would be insane. Swimming be in a pond on the ice because the ice would suck, and we'd be like, oh, but it's it sucks so good. We'd feel like we're Austin sports fans. That's how we'd feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got in more questions than I thought I would. Oh. Yeah, how long yeah, is yeah. this episode? Dude? Um, I want to end it by handing this laptop to Steve and telling him that his favorite thing in the universe has happened. There is now a Harry Potter times Vans collab. What? <laughs> Harry Potter what? Harry Potter and Vans did a collab, and there was a whole bunch of gear, and I want to know how much you're going to order. Uh, mm, that Hufflepuff? I need, I need to... <laughs> man, I was just thinking about... Oh, Deathly Hallows. The Deathly Hallows stuff. Yep. Okay. Fifty-five dollar Deathly Hallows flip flops is a little <laughs> bit extra. It's funny because I love Harry Potter, but maybe I'm just not into like sandals or shoes. I don't. There's t-shirts too. I've reread the books like so many times. Yeah. I love like I love Harry Potter. I want to go to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter like it's super badly. So we went. Oh. When I, I, I was, think I'm gonna go this summer. I've, I've never I, been. Like oh, yeah. I when well I was there. in sure. Florida, we went to uh, Universal Studios for two days. The first day we went. And we rode on, like, all the rides. And then the second day that we went, I literally only rode the, the, the one Harry Potter ride because I did not care about anything else because it's that good. It is the <laughs> best ride I've ever been on. And Do you see I my have... socks right now? Wow. Ravenclaw. Really oh, Ravenclaw Raven 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 socks. Of course you're Ravenclaw. <laughs> you're such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> literally wearing Ravenclaw socks right now. So just throwing that out What's there. What's your house, Rachel? Gryffindor. Okay, you're a Ravenclaw. <laughs> Okay. You're not admitting it. I don't even know what the like. I only oh. know basically like Raven, Gryffindor. Okay. And Gryffindor is brave. Ravenclaw is smart. Slytherins are like driven, Dicks. but also probably <laughs> evil. Hufflepuff, nice, fun, energetic, joyful. You're probably a Hufflepuff. Can I be house? <laughs> Jesse's Can I be house Huffle- Voldemort. <laughs> Oh, no. you're a Slytherin 100%. <laughs> is, is House Voldemort a thing? Yeah. No, he, he was in Slytherin. Yes. He was in Slytherin. It is also... <laughs> yeah, he's Tom name. Riddle. <laughs> yeah. Jesse, um, Jesse and Tom his Riddle. no hat in those videos. <laughs> <laughs> Skinny, tall. Yeah, By the way, yeah, yeah. I can't wait for the smart insider man uh, like animated thing to come out. Like the When Evan oh. sent me the goose thing that he made, I go, wait a minute, that's Steve's voice. He goes, yeah, I want to get Steve to be a voice actor. I'm like, oh my God, this is brilliant. Man, I... I want to do more with this silly voice. I have a couple things coming up. Might be part of uh, like a kid show. Oh, that's awesome! And also, I might be on a uh, I might be on like a song. 
Oh, that's you'd be great on a kids show. You'd yeah, be, you'd be, be awesome. awesome. Like it's animated, really like yeah. yeah. Can you plug our live events dates? Yes. And then we gotta go. I was gonna pull the. My up. dad's coming to see you tomorrow You're... at your book signing. Hell yeah, he is in Bradford. Yes, he's gonna be the big bald man. Oh, okay. Well, good. You narrowed it down to I'm sure a <laughs> lot of folks in Bradford. <laughs> my dad was gonna come. Portuguese people there, and they all have nice quaffed hair, and my dad very doesn't. Is that a thing? All right. Yes. I, I didn't know my that. dad drove into the Mississauga chapter a month or two back and he was gonna come see you but then the line was crazy long and he's like I, I don't have time for this I know I'm <laughs> just you know just doing popular. really good you know so. uh, Saturday <laughs> June 8th that's tomorrow or you might be listening to it today get in your car now um, or if you live down the street just put your shoes on uh, experience toys and games 33 Holland Street East Bradford Ontario Ontario that's a new <laughs> province that I just made up myself because I'm sick of Doug uh, June 8th, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., but if there's still people there at 3, which I hope, that'd be wonderful, uh, I will stick around. Friday, June 14th, this mm -hmm. is not just a book signing, it's Indigo Presents. Uh, it's basically the podcast, except it'll just be Jesse and I, Adam. Maybe Adam. I was going to say, is Adam yeah. coming? But he's Maybe. got a person that he cares for now? Well, two, really? Kind of more important, no offense. <laughs> a little none to, none to Adam will come back to the show when he is good and ready. Um, Friday, June 14th, 7 p.m., Indigo Presents, 20 William Kitchen Road. Uh, it's the Indigo at Kennedy Commons. So it's basically uh, right off the highway. There are tickets for that. Um, if you check my Instagram profile, you will see a link uh, to those tickets. And the next day, this is the last one I'll promote, mm -hmm. um, Saturday, June 15th, Burger Fest, that's in Vaughn, 1 Commerce Street. Again, uh, link to tickets in my profile. Uh, you need a ticket to get into the Burger Fest, and that is it. I'm only going to charge you for books, not photos and pictures like Adam West. Wait, Steve, did you write a book? <laughs> Buddy, I wrote <laughs> such a book. I did. Have you read it? Uh, I only listened to the audiobooks. That's all I do. <laughs> that's fine. That works. I bought both. Yeah! 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 How have I not bought it yet? I bought everyone's book. That's I need a to sack buy of garbage. I need to buy. <laughs> it's a bad friend. Ian Garbage. I, want <laughs> <laughs> I need to listen to the audiobook because I know how annoying that must have been to record. I've heard horror stories from everyone. So I didn't mind it. Oh, really? I didn't, it was oh, okay. the first day I was like, I am not going to survive this because it was supposed to be six four-hour days. Uh, well, it was. Um, but I got better at it. Oh, okay. Because I've... Everyone I know who's done an audiobook, it's just apparently the worst experience of their life. Words so. are hard. Oh, okay. <laughs> Words are hard, but you guys said a lot this episode. Too yes. many so podcast hosts in, in, in one room. It's a bad <laughs> idea. No, it was, it was great. I've discovered that you guys are so much smarter than we are on our show. Holy shit. So thank you for upping the IQ about, I don't know, 200 points. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you guys were like bringing up good points, bringing up good points. If you just want to be on the team, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of where I'm at. Like you yeah, either want to be on the team yeah. or you don't. Goodbye if you don't. Like yeah. I don't care. You say it smarter though. <laughs> so listen to Ian and Rachel on the Staff and Graph podcast on your favorite podcatcher. Staff and Garbage. And we'll be back on. Yes, I have a Ian, how do you pronounce the name of the city in Michigan? Oh yeah, I can't pronounce words. Um, so it's tech. It's Saginaw. 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 I've yeah. been saying Saginaw my whole life. Saginaw. Yeah, that's where Draymond Green's from, actually. Oh, okay. From Saginaw. Yeah, Saginaw. It's Saginaw. Made up town. Oh. So now it's the Staff and Draft podcast. Oh. Like Nikita Kuchera. 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 That's great that you know that. <laughs> now. Steve and I will be back on Monday, maybe. Oh, When's the next yeah. hockey game? Sunday. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so Monday. We should do Monday. Yeah. Maybe I can't that'll be the thing that we do. All oh, right. well, then great. So, Monday. Okay. All right. <laughs> and Sons, Adam Wilde, maybe with another guest. We'll see. Also, if you want to hear more nerdy talk about the Leafs Geeks uh, kind of stuff, I do that podcast, the Leafs Geeks podcast. And fun fact, we're doing a, a live event in July, mid-July. I haven't decided mm -hmm. when, but... Uh, all the proceeds are going to go to charity, to the Canadian Tire uh, Jumpstart program. Hey. It's really good. It's to get uh, underprivileged, underprivileged children uh, access to you know sports. Uh, it's something I've always You're really such liked. Such a good person. Amazing. And where can people find more info about that? So I'm going to be tweeting about it, or you can listen to my podcast, uh, the Leafs Geeks podcast. I'll be giving more info about it ASAP when I get it. But yeah, Perfect. follow me on Twitter, at Ian Graff, uh, as uh, Jeff O'Neill likes to call me. And Rachel, <laughs> do you have anything else to plug? 
No, I'm just on the Staff and Giraffe podcast. Staff and, and Giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> yup. Saginaw. <laughs> Saginaw podcast. Um, that's where you can find me. You can find me on Twitter. Um, if you come at me and attack me, I probably will not answer. But if you're nice, I will 100% answer you. So, yeah. That's where Perfect. you find me. Thanks for so, having us on, guys. It was really oh, fun. Yeah, I no really problem. appreciate it. Lesson of, of the day. Get out of here. <laughs> Be nice and get the hell out. Let's go Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle, at Adam W Y L D E, and at Jesse Blake. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Brought to you by Panago Pizza. Order at Panago.com and stuff your face with deliciousness.